begin the live broadcast. Okay, Commissioner Eggers, it's all you. Thank you, appreciate that, Sarah. And again, I wanna take an opportunity to welcome everybody, all board members and all the uh, residents who may be watching to our uh, July 8th Ford Pinellas board meeting. Um, and I just wanted to take again a moment of silence to begin our, uh, to begin our meeting, um, to recognize, first of all, our, our ju uh, July 4th, which is obviously our country's birthday and um, what a, uh, what a great country it ha we have. And obviously, as we've been uh, discussing over the last month or two, uh, always room for improvement. Um, and we'll be addressing a lot of that in the, in the months and the year to come. Also wanna remember those who've passed from COVID and their families and their friends, um, obviously very difficult times personally for a lot of people. Um, and then to keep uh, folks in our prayers that have um, individuals and small businesses uh, that have suffered from economic loss and hardship. And then finally, uh, to keep in our prayers, our police officers and uh, those protesting for social changes, that uh, all is for helping our country get better. So if you just take a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right, uh, again, good afternoon and welcome uh, to our virtual uh, Pinellas board meeting, which is convening pursuant to executive order uh, number 2069 issued by the office of Governor Ron DeSantis on March 20th of 2020 and extended by executive orders 2112, 2114 and 2150, allowing local government bodies to conduct meetings of their governing boards without having a quorum of its members present physically or at any specific location and utilizing communications, media technology, such as telephonic or video conferencing as provided by section 12054-5B2 of the Florida statutes. Procedures for public comment will be explained by the process coordinator shortly. And at this time, the members of Ford Pinellas Board appearing remotely for this meeting will be stated by the technology moderator, Sarah Cape. Sarah? Thank you, Commissioner Eggers. Good afternoon. I'm gonna ask each board member individually to confirm that you are here, able to hear us and can respond. Please note that everyone but myself in the chair is currently on mute. You should be able to unmute yourself, but if you're having trouble, I can also unmute you. The board members appearing virtually today are Chair Commissioner Dave Eggers, Pinellas County. I'm here, I can hear you just fine, thank you. Thank you. Vice Chair, Council Member Darden Rice, City of St. Petersburg. Hello, here. Thank you. Treasurer, Mayor Cookie Kennedy, City of India Rocks Beach, representing the beach communities. Here, thank you. Thank you. Secretary, Commissioner Janet Long, Pinellas County, representing PSTA. Good afternoon, I'm here. Thank you. Mayor Julie Bujalski, City of Dunedin. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Commissioner Connor Donovan, City of Tarpon Springs, representing the cities of Tarpon Springs, Oldsmar, and Safety Harbor. I'm here, thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Susie Sofer, City of Bel Air Bluffs, representing the inland communities. Here, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Commissioner Michael Smith, City of Largo. Here. Thank you. Vice Mayor David Alberton, City of Clearwater. Present. Good afternoon, everyone. Council Member Brandy Gabbard, City of St. Petersburg. Hello, I'm here. Thank you. Commissioner Karen Seal, Pinellas County. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. And Commissioner Ken Welch, Pinellas County. Hi, folks. I'm here. Thank you. The board members are here and accounted for. Please note that everyone except for the chair and process coordinator is now on mute. Tina, you please state the procedures to be followed during this virtual meeting. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to see you all here. I'll take the next few minutes to review the process that has been devised for this meeting. As you're aware, there will be a technology moderator and a process coordinator who will be tasked with facilitating the virtual meeting. 
For this virtual meeting, the technology moderator will be Sarah Caper, principal planner with Forward Pinellas. And the process coordinator will be myself, Tina Jablon, executive administrative secretary to Forward Pinellas. Any person may be heard by the Forward Pinellas board for not more than three minutes on any proposition before the board unless, unless such time is modified by the chair. The options and methods for doing that will be explained in a moment. To ensure an accurate record of the meeting, when addressing the board, the member of the public must first state and spell his or her name, state his or her address, and announce what agenda item they will be speaking to. Throughout the meeting, we ask that all presenters and commenters also identify themselves by name each time they speak, unless they have been introduced properly or specifically called on by name. Additionally, please be mindful of not speaking over one another. Prior to a vote on any matter, the chair will seek public comment. The technology moderator or the process coordinator will then ask for virtual hand raising of all those wishing to speak on an item. The number of hands will be noted and reported to the chair. The technology moderator will then unmute each speaker in turn in the order that is shown by Zoom, allowing the speaker three minutes or the time as modified by the chair for each speaker. Finally, the chair may seek more information from Forward Pinellas staff, the presenter, or other sources. For each item requiring a vote, the board member making a motion should identify themselves and clearly state their motion. The board member seconding should also identify themselves and second the motion. All votes will be accomplished by a roll call vote. We ask that everyone please silence all cell phones and other noise making devices. We also ask that the board members and members of the public allow for each presentation to be concluded prior to asking any questions, interrupting or making comments. Um, you can, however, raise your hand virtually during the presentations and Zoom will keep track of those hands and we will call on them at the end of each presentation. At this time, Wit, I'll turn it over to you to take up recognitions and announcements. Thank you very much, Tina. And thanks again to the staff for getting us uh, ready for another board meeting. Appreciate all that you do. I do have a couple of uh, announcements I'd like to let the board know. I'm always very excited. Uh, when I can uh, announce a promotion uh, uh, within uh, of our staff members. And today um, I'm announcing uh, that uh, we've promoted Rebecca Stisley as a finance and accounting analyst. Rebecca has been with us uh, since I believe 2016. And um, she was hired originally as a secretary and she has taken on her responsibilities as the MPO accountant um, very, very ably. Uh, she's demonstrated um, just uh, a great mastery of the process and the program, especially working with our partners at the federal level and the state of Florida Department of Transportation. Uh, her promotion was effective uh, this week on July 6th, so we're really happy to see that. And it's really part of a two-part uh, step for her because in a couple of years she will assume uh, responsibility as the chief financial uh, officer sort of of the whole organization as retirements begin to happen. So this is step one of what we hope will be a, a long tenure with Ford Pinellas. The other thing I'd like to um, announce, and I'm really happy to see this as well, is some recognition by the National Association of Development Organizations. Uh, last week, we found out that um, the um, resilient Tampa Bay transportation project, which was a regional effort uh, between Hillsborough MPO, Ford Pinellas, Pasco MPO, the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, and the Florida Department of Transportation was uh, given an award of excellence uh, in transportation uh, by NATO. Uh, and that uh, study was specifically to address the impacts of sea level rise on our transportation network. The project was managed by the Hillsborough MPO, but Ford Pinellas uh, and TBRPC and FDOT and Pasco County all were major contributors uh, to that effort. And I really want to reach out and congratulate Rodney Chapman of our staff for taking the lead and working uh, very ably with that regional team. We've got a, um, a lot of work ahead of us uh, to make our uh, transportation network more resilient, uh, but it's a big issue and I'm glad to see the recognition that we've done a, at least a good job of the initial planning and now we've got to um, keep, keep at it. Does anybody have any questions about either of those items for me? Anybody? Okay, thanks, Witt. Uh, 
Yeah, congratulations to the team and Rodney for that work and um, also to Rebecca for her promotion. I think that's, it's always nice when you can, you can promote from within. Uh, it doesn't happen all the time, but uh, it does make it extra special. But anyway, congratulations to both of them. Uh, we're going to move on to the consent agenda. On that, on those items, in that agenda, I have approval of the minutes of June 10th, approval of committee appointments, a map adjustment, approval of the commission for the transportation disadvantage agreement, adoption of the resolution, approval of procurement for the uh, Forward Pinellas Planning Consultants, approval of procurement of the auditing firm recommendation. Uh, I know there was two selection committees or both of those, and I really appreciate the work that they did. Um, approval of the Pinellas Planning Council work plan, approval of the annual budget millage uh, for 20, uh, fiscal year 21 and adoption of associated resolution, approval of the unified planning work program uh, amendment and approval of counts, crash data and levels of service program scope of services. All that on the consent agenda. Is anybody have uh, anything they wanna pull from the agenda to discuss? Um, and I suppose since this is obviously a voting item that will, uh, Sarah, uh, are there anybody that would like to speak to this item? Or any of these items on the consent? Yes, anyone of the public who wishes to address the board, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button or star nine on the phone. And you may do so at this time. Commissioner Eggers, I see no members of the public wishing to speech on this issue. Okay, great. Uh, do I have a motion for approval of the Move consent? to approve. Yes, second. And did you get those, Tina? I got Vice Mayor Albritton. I do not know who made the second. Susie, okay. I have a first and a second then. Okay, great. I'll take the, the roll, roll call, call now. Yep. yep. Mayor Bujowski. Aye. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Sofer? Aye. Vice Mayor Albritton? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Mayor Kennedy? Mayor Kennedy, you're on mute. Yes. Council Member Rice? Yes. Commissioner Welch? Yes. Council Member Gabbard? Yes. Commissioner Seal? Yes. And Commissioner Long? Commissioner Long, you are also on mute. I don't see her there. Okay, well, um, the motion carries unanimously. Um, it was uh, actually seven yeses and four ayes. Um, <laughs> I kept track this time too, Commissioner Eggers. <laughs> I don't know, we, we lost some eyes in there today, but uh, in any event, the uh, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, and we'll move on to uh, <clears throat> the public hearing part of our agenda. There's no PPC items this month, so we'll just go directly to the MPO portion. There's a proposed amendment to the F FY 2019-20. Uh, to FY 23-24 TIP amendment. Uh, there's an amendment for that, and we need an action on that, and the item will be covered by Jensen Hackett. Is Jensen there, please? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and good afternoon, board. For the record, this is Jensen Hackett with the Department of Transportation. Today, I have a TIP amendment to present for your approval. The project is project number 445-886-1, this is the resurfacing of I-275 from the Sunshine Skyway Bridge to the Maximo Point Bridges in the southern portion of Pinellas County. This project was approved as part of the fiscal year 21 through 25 TIP that you all approved at your June board meeting as a new project, and it's found on page 3-58 of that. Preliminary engineering is scheduled for fiscal year 21 and construction in fiscal year 23. However, the TIP that was approved last month only becomes effective on October 1st of 2020, which is the beginning of the new federal fiscal year. So FDOT would like to add this project into the current year, which is state fiscal year 21 that actually began on July 1st last week, which correlates with your 
current TIP, which is the fiscal year 20 through 24 TIP that is in effect through September 30th. And this is so that we can begin the preliminary engineering in September for that project. As always, no other projects in either TIP, your current fiscal year 20 through 24, or your newly adopted fiscal year 21 through 25 TIP are affected by this amendment. Um, and Mr. Chair, I will need a motion to approve and then a subsequent roll call vote for approval. And I, as always, I can take any questions the board may have on this item. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you, uh, Jensen. I appreciate that. Are there any questions from board members for Jensen? Councilmember uh, yes. Gabbard? Thank you. Uh, Jensen, so um, I was curious, since this is a resurfacing project, um, typically, you know, in, I'm going to call it non-COVID times, uh, when traffic gets very heavy there on southbound 275, um, you know, the, the toll plaza backs up considerably. Um, sometimes it'll even back up as far back as to 22nd Avenue South. And it seems to be that the reason for that is because of people making change going through those right lanes of the toll and the left lanes, which are the sun pass lanes, get very kind of congested and people can't get around to use them. Since we're doing a resurfacing project, would it be possible to look at maybe some improvements such as restriping or something that might be able to help get those sun pass drivers through faster? Um, or easier to kind of alleviate some of that backup? So we actually received this yesterday from Witt, um, and he said that you had this comment. Um, we've actually forwarded this off to our traffic operations um, so that they can look into this problem, and we will obviously uh, make sure that we can take into those some of the considerations that you just had um, and voice there with our traffic ops team. And if we have any recommendations on that, we will come back to you guys and let you know that we were able to implement the strategies or something for like Wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate you uh, looking into that. Thank you, Chair. Yep, no yep. worries. No problem. Anybody else? Any other questions for Jensen? I don't see any myself, Sarah, so I'm assuming no other questions. I see no other board members with their hand okay. raised. All right, well, then let's Move check. Approval. With, let's check with the public, see if there's any public comments. Any members of the public wishing to address the board should raise their hand by pressing the raised hand button or star nine on the phone. I see no members of the public wishing to speak on this issue. Okay, great. Uh, now we'll need a motion and a second, please. Move approval. Second. I have a motion by Council Member Rice and a second by Commissioner Long. Okay, roll call, please. Mayor Bujalski? Aye. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Sofer? Aye. Vice Mayor Albritton? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Commissioner Smith, are you still there? Yes, I. Mayor Kennedy? Yes. Council Member Rice? Yes. Commissioner Welch? Yes. Council Member Gabbard? Yes. Commissioner Seal? Yes. Commissioner Long? Yes. And Commissioner Eggers. Aye. And that motion carries unanimously. Mr. Chair? Yes. I, I yes. apologize. Um, if I might be allowed to cast my yes vote for our previous action, since I inadvertently had to step away while you were all taking your vote, I apologize. OK. Thank you, Commissioner Long. You're welcome. All right, uh, we'll move on to our, our reports, our presentation, um, or, or some action. I, I guess we have one action item, and we'll start with PSTA. Commissioner Long, do you have an update for us? Oh, my goodness, do I ever. Today, <laughs> we had our unveiling of our brand new brand, 
for the BRT Central Avenue line. And unfortunately, since I'm not at the courthouse and I don't have my trusty Doyle next to me, I am unable to bring up a picture of what that looks like, but you're going to really, it's going to be a knock your soft south when you see it because it's just so innovative and it so speaks to the identity of downtown St. Pete and it's called, are you ready? Hear the drum roll? Sunrunner. Sounds you, great. Well, who came, who? has a reaction. He died in yesterday. Very cool. <laughs> Thank Thanks, <you>. Darden. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's just a delightful, eclectic, really fun look to the new buses that'll be running on that line. And I couldn't be more proud. And as a lot of you know, because several of you have been on the board, this has been um, a journey for sure that has taken many years and a lot of effort and a lot of time from all of the board members, with some that are currently sitting here right now, Commission, Councilor Rice, uh, Commissioner Eggers, I know Commissioner Welch is here, all have had a hand in bringing this to fruition. And it really is the first step in a very long journey and the beginning of what will be the catalyst for the 41 mile plan to really connect and unite our region. So I just, I feel like it's like birthing a brand new vision for the future for our kids and for our grandkids. And it was exciting, hot, 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 but very exciting. And that's the latest and greatest from PSTA, but stay tuned. There's more to come in about another month. So lots of exciting things going on. In spite Thank of you. COVID. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Long. You're welcome. Uh, Commissioner Seal for Tibarda update activities. Uh, yes. Um, so we had a meeting on, via Zoom on Monday, June 22nd. Uh, we voted eight to one to adopt the Envision 2030 Regional Transit Development Plan. I want to emphasize that we will continue to operate at the current level under a status quo scenario, which means we adopted an unfunded regional transit vision network, and but we support continued evaluation of calls to action, and we're gonna collaborate with all of our local partners. Um, the continued planning activities will include the regional rapid transit PD and E study, the innovative transit technology study, and Envision 2030 annual progress reports with a five-year major update. We also hope to explore regional ferry service and regional service for the transportation disadvantage. The second um, important matter was the regional rapid transit. We um, voted again eight to one to advance. We originally had five alternatives and we are going to advance three alternatives to what we call milestone three of this project. This includes alternate one, which is a baseline transportation system management with express bus service along the entire corridor with no investment in interstate alignment and minimal investment at stations. Alternative three, which is a mid-level investment with 77% dedicated freeway bus rapid transit lanes and alternative five, which is the high level investment with 87% dedicated freeway BRT lanes. Um, finally, we had a um, audit report uh, from fiscal of 2019 by Clifton, Larson and Allen, but unable to, um, we were unable to take action because we lacked a quorum at that um, point. So it's been deferred to the July meeting, which is scheduled for July 17th. Um, at 10 a.m. again via Zoom. Any questions? Yeah, uh, Commissioner Long. I, I don't have questions, uh, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Seal, but I did want to share uh, that we have yet to have our finance uh, committee meeting in preparation for our board meeting later this month. But that you may remember, I think some of you said, uh, surely will, the days when T. Barter did not have any monies and 
I'm so happy to share that currently we do have money in spite of the fact that the state uh, the governor vetoed our funding for uh, our appropriation that we had been working on this year. All that to say, I think at our board meeting, we're going to hear some incredible opportunities for the future of public transportation in our region. And I'm not going to share today, but it's going to be very exciting when we bring you a report next month. Just FYI. Thank you. Any any other questions or any questions at all for uh, Commissioner Steele? Sarah, I can't see everybody, but I'm assuming not. I don't see any hands raised. Okay, thank you. And um, the, that report was a segue, a good segue into the next item, which uh, I know that uh, Bill Ball from Tyndale Oliver will be here to give us a little peek of the T-Bar to Envision 2030 Regional Transit Development Plan. Um, so, Bill, are you there? I'm here, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Can you hear me okay? A little bit. Speak up a little bit. That would be great. Okay. And I think I have control of it now, Sarah. You should, and a reminder to all the participants, please hold your questions and comments till after the presentation, but you can use the raised hand feature while the presentation is going on. Okay, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, for the record, this is Bill Ball with Tyndall Oliver, and I'm pleased to be here representing TBARTA today to talk about the first ever regional transit development plan for the Tampa Bay area, Envision 2030. Sarah, I think I lost control of the PowerPoint. There we go. I'm gonna start by just talking about what it's all about. And the number one thing that comes with Envision 2030 is that, that item right in the middle there. And that's that strategic blueprint, that vision for the future for regional transit as an emphasis area. There's other elements of that as well. It's important for funding for transit in Florida. And it's also important for TBARTA to use as a promotional tool for all of its services. We did work closely with all of the key regional partners, including the five local transit operators. You can see the local services that are provided on the map there on this slide. We also worked with the MPOs as well as Florida DOT. Now, why are we doing this? Well, these are the values and benefits that we're pursuing as it relates to regional transit investments. I'm gonna highlight a couple of these in the next couple slides to give you an idea of the benefits we're talking about. The first one I wanna talk about is regional job access. And we evaluated the Envision 2030 plan. If we were able to implement that, we would see a 58% increase in the number of jobs that the average resident has access to via transit. So you can see, especially for the low to mid income, low to moderate income areas, we're able to really see an, a significant increase in job access. The other item I wanna emphasize is regional competitiveness. I think you're all aware that the Tampa Bay Partnership works on an annual evaluation of how Tampa Bay ranks with other regions around the country. Unfortunately, we rank at the bottom or near the bottom in many of those categories. So what we envision is this plan would help us target some of the issues that we have, especially with transit investments, as well as with housing and transportation affordability. We did reach more than, well more than 10,000 people through the public and stakeholder engagement process over the last 15 months. And we were able to use that input to help develop the vision that I'll share with you today. Bottom line, there's two top priorities for TBARTA, and this is something we really wanted to emphasize in the last couple of months in particular. Number one is we're targeting to increase the total transit funding that comes to the Tampa Bay region, whether it be for local services, regional services. Bottom line is increasing our slice of the pie for transit in the region. And second to that is we need to build consensus on what are the best things that TBARTA can do to help us move on the path to the vision that we developed as part of this process. 
Now we did spend time learning from other regions around the country. We, they generally have been more successful in securing federal transit funding than we have been in the Tampa Bay area. So we wanted to see what are they doing? What are their best practices? And we've identified many of those concepts in our plan to be considered as part of the next steps in the process for Envision 2030. We didn't reinvent the wheel. We, we started with the plans that the trans, local transit agencies had already prepared, as well as the MPO plans and previous work of TBARTA. We used uh, public input and our technical analysis to put together the vision that we have today. And here's that vision. So you can see that we have a range of transit technologies that are shown on this map that shows connectivity in terms of transit throughout the five county region. It includes regional rapid transit as that spine project on the 275 corridor. And it ranges from the various other technologies as well, including the commute Tampa Bay services, van pooling, as well as a regional transportation disadvantage component. Now, now that we have that vision, we put that out there, we need to talk about, well, what can we do to move toward that vision in the next 10 years, which is the Envision 2030 timeframe. And what we did working closely with staff is we put together three different scenarios for consideration as part of that evaluation. The first one is the status quo, as Commissioner Seal mentioned before, and that's continuing with the commute Tampa Bay services and the van pools, and then continuing to focus on regional transit planning. So we also looked at a couple of other scenarios that are unfunded at this point, but wanted to be a part of that vision that we're working toward. The second scenario was we called the low impact scenario. And it basically is TBAR to pursuing additional funding that would allow them in turn to provide funding, additional funding to the local transit operators to improve some of the existing regional services they provide today. And then third, the high impact scenario. This is the more significant transit investment that ultimately we would like to achieve. And it includes the phase one of the regional rapid transit project that was talked about earlier as well. And phase one is essentially going from downtown St. Pete to downtown Tampa as a starting point for that project. And then that scenario also includes four new express bus routes to provide connectivity to the other counties in the region as well. And this is what that scenario three looks like on the map. It is a subset of the vision, but you can see that it would be great progress towards that vision if we were able to make it happen. So the next step was let's look at costs and revenues. I'll start with the revenue bars, which basically shows the revenues that TBARTA currently has today with existing sources. And this is over the 10 year period combined. So over that full 10 year period on the operating side of that equation, they have $42 million available. And then you see the cost of each scenario associated with what we just talked about. Uh, of course, it's balanced in the status quo. And then you see the deficit for the low impact and high impact scenario. In similar form, you see the capital cost over the same 10 year period, very little capital investment in the first two scenarios. And then of course the high impact scenario is the major capital investment largely associated with regional rapid transit. And that's where you see the major capital deficit in this chart as well. So I wanted to give you an idea of the existing funding and where it comes from today for TBARTA. On the left side, you see the operating funding that's available, about 42 million. On the right is about 10 million. So a combined 52 million over the 10 year period. You can see the bulk of those funds come from state and federal sources. The only local is in the gold there on the operating side, which is about 5.6 million over that 10 year period. And that's generated from the county contributions that are made on an annual basis as indicated in this table, which is about $550,000 total, and it's distributed to each county based on their population. So the big challenge moving forward is funding for the future and funding from two perspectives. It's the agency operations itself, as well as funding for future major regional transit projects like regional rapid transit. So the challenge that comes next is for the board, TBARTA board, to collaborate with local partners on what strategies are the most likely to move, to move forward to, to pursue that funding. 
what we've talked about with the TBARDIS committees and the board is the potential for some type of collaborative workshop or multiple workshops that will be facilitated with local partners to go through the options that we've identified and have as a group build consensus on what next steps should be taken. To support that discussion, we did put together a call to action and specific recommendations in these three areas. I'll talk briefly about each. First is the policy call to action. And of course, the board did adopt Envision 2030 last month at their board meeting. Uh, the next steps are to work on continuing to demonstrate TBAR's value today and that potential value in the future, those benefits, and then continuing to pursue and secure support consensus support from the local partners throughout the region. And that goes ties back to those collaborative workshops as well. Again, on the funding side, there's things that TBARTA staff can do now, like becoming a designated recipient. That's in the works and will happen this year. And then the bottom line is securing some dedicated and sustainable funding from the state is, is the primary target that we're talking about. And then looking at uh, exploring opportunities to leverage new state and federal transit funding. So there's a lot of options we've identified in the plan. Most of them require some legislative change, frankly, at the, at the state level. So there's a lot of work to be done to pursue this funding. And then finally, the commitment and collaboration. Again, this is, this is really the idea of cultivating support and champions for the Envision 2030 plan and the pursuit of the funding. Champions at the TBARTA board level, the MPO boards, the county commissions, the state legislative delegations, each of the transit authorities as well. So working on demonstrating that return on investment that we can bring to the entire region with regional investments in transit. Again, I'll reiterate the benefits and values that we identified as that have great potential for the future of the region, especially that job access in the region and regional competitiveness. Bottom line, continuing to support economic development in the region. As Commissioner Seal mentioned, these are the three key components that the board adopted as part of Envision 2030 at their board meeting on the 22nd of June. They did adopt the unfunded regional vision. They adopted the status quo because that's what they have the funding in place to support today. And they also approved the continued evaluation of the calls to actions and recommendations to be evaluated in the future collaborative workshops with local partners. Next steps, making presentations like today, but throughout the region, county commissions and MPOs and the chair's coordinating committee. Uh, again, building education and awareness of the plan and ultimately building support for where we go from here. So stay tuned as the board will be, TBAR board will be working on what form these future collaborative workshops will take. So you will be hearing from TBARTA in terms of when those are set up and scheduled for your participation. And then finally, there's a lot more information out on the TBARTA website and the Envision 2030 webpage that's indicated on this slide. And I'll be glad to take any questions at this point. <clears throat> Bill, thank you so much. Appreciate that presentation. And Sarah, if you could uh, check with uh, the hands if there's any questions uh, from the board members. Sure. Um, I see Commissioner Long, looks like you have your hand raised. Yes. Am I the only one? I see no other board members with their hands raised. Oh, well. Everybody wants to hear you, Janet. So well, go ahead. Well, um, Mr. Chair, respectfully, I was going to suggest that before we before we started moving down the path of working on the T Barda issues as outlined by Bill's incredible presentation. And thank you, Bill, for all of the hard work that you and your team have put into that on behalf of TBARTA. I know that for, for me, um, our own county has an awful lot of uh, conversation and discussions to have with regard to transportation, to transportation funding and our very own trust fund. And as we work to finalize our budget uh, for next year, given all of the hiccups that we've encountered with COVID, 
I do think that we need to have a little bit of time to pause and develop a more finite strategic plan for our partner counties um, that do not, I mean, there's so much entailed in Bill's presentation and a lot of it, uh, quite frankly, has not been presented to all of the commissions of the partner partners for TBARDA, number one. And number two, nor have they been shared with the county administrators of those counties. And I worry that we are getting our head over our skis just because there's so much we're dealing with right now. And not to say we don't have to have this conversation, but I think it really needs to start with, for example, here we are forward Pinellas and, and I think we have to take into consideration our own budget with forward Pinellas and have our executive committee meeting workshop to discuss it and perhaps then bring a recommendation back to the board. I don't know, I'm just, I'm just trying to articulate my immediate thoughts, but I do feel very strongly that we have to have a very strategic plan about how we're gonna move forward, just because there are so many pieces to this big puzzle. I don't know, I probably didn't say all that right, but hopefully it made sense to someone or all of the rest of you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And no Mr. Chair, if I can respond to that. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Commissioner Long for bringing that up. Um, I do wanna mention that um, we are gonna have this as a topic of conversation briefly on Friday at the um, Transportation Management Area Leadership Group meeting. Uh, with Hillsborough and Pasco and ourselves. Um, David Green and I will facilitate uh, about a half hour conversation. Again, and we don't have much time, so it's really a start of a conversation, but really engaging the regional partners in how we grow the transit funding pie. Um, and, and to Bill's point in the presentation, make sure that we have the resources that we need at both the local and regional level to have a, a fully functioning transit system to serve our growing area. Uh, you're right, this is an important conversation. We've barely scratched the surface um, in our own county. And we're gonna certainly take the next year to really expand that conversation greatly. And I look forward to um, you know, sharing with you some of the steps we'll be taking to, to expand that conversation. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could for just a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, your comments, okay, David? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I appreciate your comments with, and thank you for bringing up the TMA because that's a great example of how careful we have to be about getting our head over our skis because in that group, it leaves out our two other counties and at least one of those two is right on the cusp of trying to leave T. Barta. So I do think it's really critical that we either expand the conversation or we don't leave them behind because that is just gonna muddy the waters even further. Thank uh, you. Good, yep, good point. Yeah, it, it would seem over the next year, um, getting um, our, our own MPO to fully embrace it, the county commission to fully embrace it, and then our own you know, PSTA to embrace it, at least. Then you have Pinellas County at the table, if we're all on the same page as a very, you know, willing, able and excited partner going forward. And I think if, if each of the counties can kind of get that, I mean, it's gonna take some time because everybody's interested in uh, the funding. And if we take, if we get funding, where's it gonna come from? Is it taking funding from somebody else? I think there's a lot of issues and questions that we need to to wrestle with over the next year, but I, I certainly think each county needs to have that conversation. I know we're starting, we've been having it for a while, we'll continue to have it the next year. Um, but yeah, anyway, thank you for uh, for that presentation. Anybody else, any other comments? Mayor Bujalski had her hand raised. Okay. Mayor, go ahead. Thanks. I was just reading the staffing and and this particular item is is just for informational purposes, correct? 
Correct. Right. Okay, so we're not voting on anything at this point. No. And I think what I heard uh, Commissioner Seal say before, the current recommendation is for the status quo, um, which I'm assuming means um, not looking for additional funding, just the normal funding. Um, so I, I don't disagree with you, Commissioner Long. I think a lot of conversations need to be had, but we don't have to vote on anything at this point. So that's probably good. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, looks like Councilmember Rice has her hand raised. Sorry, Darden. Go ahead. You're muted. You're you're still muted. Are you? Okay. okay. Thank right. you. Sorry, I'm I'm calling in on my phone. There's. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I. I'm trying to understand a little bit better about the T. Barta board decision to adopt the status quo scenario. Um, I, I'm just trying to understand that a little bit more. That was adopting status quo for the 10 year outlook or was that adopt? And I guess this question is for uh, Commissioner Seal or Commissioner Long but um, what, what was the reasoning behind that? Is it, was it just out of pragmatism of trying to work with what we have? Um, because in Witt's letter, there was um, you know, the statement that the status quo is not sustainable. So can you explain that a little bit to me, please? Maybe I can start. Um, based on my understanding of how the board went, and then commissioners can, can chime in. Who's there, that? The feeling was that. Who that is the, that talking? I'm sorry. This is Bill Ball. Did you want? Did you want me to go ahead and get? Go my, ahead. Yes. Go, go ahead, Bill. Sorry. Um, yes, the board felt at this point that they should adopt the scenario that's funded with available revenue sources they have today. They also adopted the regional transit vision as something they want to continue working toward. Uh, so with the understanding that we don't have funding to work toward that, to implement that vision yet, it was just a formality of adopting the scenario that was fundable today and then work on the funding over the next uh, coming months at, or, or, or longer as appropriate to pursue the vision. Okay. That that helps make a, a little bit more sense. Thank you. Sarah, anybody else? I don't see anyone else. Uh, board members, if you could, as you have questions, please try to use the raise hand feature in Zoom. It makes it easier um, than looking for the waving hands, but I think we caught all of you uh, this time. Okay, um, and and we're, we're not taking a vote today, but um, we are going to uh, see if anybody from the public would like to weigh in. Um, so Sarah, is there anybody that would like from the public that would like to comment on this one? Any members of the public wishing to speak on this issue, please use the raise hand button or star nine on the phone if you've called in. Commissioner Eggers, I see no members of the public wishing to speak on this item. Okay, great. Thank you, Sarah. We're gonna move on to uh, item 5D, which is the multimodal present, uh, prioritization process. And Chelsea Favaro is gonna give us that presentation. Chelsea, are you with us? I am. All right. All right, well, good afternoon, board. I'm going to walk you through this item that we've been talking about regarding uh, project prioritization. Hopefully soon. All right, so just really wanted to start off by talking about what the role of Ford Pinellas is. Um, you know, after the merger with the Pinellas Planning Council and the MPO, the goal is really to align our transportation funding uh, with projects that support the land use goals of the countywide plan and ultimately of Advantage Pinellas, the recently adopted lo uh, long range transportation plan for Pinellas County. Um, to do that, we develop an annual list of priorities, and these are priorities for state and federal funding 
And then we go ahead and we work with the Florida Department of Transportation to advance the projects that are included on that priority list. Uh, this graphic may look very familiar to, to you. Uh, this demonstrates what we heard from the extensive public outreach that we conducted during the development of Advantage Pinellas. You know, after all the outreach, outreach we asked um, all of our citizens, you know, how would you like to spend, how would you like your transportation dollars spent by mode in Pinellas County? Um, the, the response we got was about 40% of that funding on alternative modes like sidewalks, bicycle facilities, technology investments, about 40% towards transit investments, and only about 20% towards additional capacity uh, for our roadways. And this graphic here shows where we ended up with the Advantage Pinellas plan. And we've had this conversation about, while we know that the public really desired that spending uh, by mode that we saw on, on the left-hand side, based on restrictions uh, with the federal and state dollars that we receive, we kind of ended up with the right with the graphic on the right-hand side. Uh, there are some uh, funding sources that are reserved for capacity projects only, but with the graphic on the right-hand side, I, I will remind you that we did spend 100% of our flexible funding uh, resources on non-automotive uh, modes of transportation. So in order to help kind of move that needle and make sure that we're meeting uh, the, the expectations of the public that we're spending as much money as possible or as much of the funding as possible on these non-motorized modes, uh, we really have to look at how we program our priorities or what kind of projects we prioritize. Uh, you'll see a list here. These are just some of the projects that you have on your currently adopted priority list. And you'll see there are a lot of bicycle and pedestrian projects. We even have bus replacement projects and complete streets projects, in addition to you know, US-19 interchanges and other roadway capacity projects. But with the priority list that we currently have, we don't have a great process in place uh, that really kind of provides a pipeline for getting projects onto that priority list. So we would like to come up with a formal process to identify which future projects will make it onto a priority list. And this will really help to provide some, uh, some level of certainty to our local governments. So if someone says, hey, listen, I'm really looking to get some state or federal dollars for this project, we can say, okay, this is how you do it. And it's just a much simpler way uh, to help us streamline moving our projects forward. Uh, as we developed uh, the Advantage Pinellas plan, uh, we did come up with some kind of key set-asides for those most flexible funding sources. Uh, we did commit to putting aside $1 million annually for our Complete Streets project and we, projects, and we do have our Complete Streets grant funding program that helps provide uh, which project, it identifies which project will get on the priority list each year. So we'd like to continue with that moving forward. Uh, backfilling the, that line item with the project identified through our competitive grant program. The next two you see on here are active transportation projects and our trail overpasses. Uh, we worked very hard over the last couple of years through the development of the active transportation plan to identify what those projects will be. So we have committed to, through the priority list, using the active transportation plan to continue to move those projects forward uh, through the prioritization process. Uh, through Advantage Pinellas, we also agreed to set aside about $1 million annually for technology projects and also over $200,000 annually for local and regional transit capital projects. However, we don't have a great way to identify what those technology and transit capital projects will be, so we'd like to recommend that we use this process that we've come up with to infill what those projects will look like as we add them onto the priority list. This is the proposed process, and you have a very detailed nine-page description of this uh, in your packet, so I'd like to go over some of the highlights with you today. Um, we'll issue a call for projects, and we'd like to ask that the minimum project cost be $350,000. Uh, this is because it can take a lot of staff time and energy and also quite a few years to get a project from you know, application to construction. So we'd like to set a minimum threshold uh, for the projects that we advance. We are going to ask that each uh, applicant uh, submit a maximum of three projects for consideration this year. Um, there is going to be a lot of staff review that goes into this, a lot of work to score the projects and also run it through our committees and ultimately to you for a final recommendation. So we want to make sure that we don't come up with a list of about 100 different projects that we're going to be working through the process. All modes are going to be considered through this competitive uh, process. However, we are going to ask that no standalone bicycle and pedestrian projects are, 
are included in the applications. And this is because, as I had mentioned, we went through that whole process to develop the active transportation plan and we want to make sure that the bicycle and pedestrian projects that we're advancing really align with the effort that went into developing that plan that was also uh, endorsed by the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee, the Technical Coordinating Committee, and ultimately you all as a, the Ford Pinellas Board. Each application that we receive, we're going to evaluate against a set of determined criteria that support the goals of the of the plan. Um, and th these are the goals of the active transportation plan. And we also uh, cross check the goals of, um, sorry, of the Advantage Pinellas plan. We cross check those with uh, the comprehensive plans of the local governments and also the Pinellas County strategic plan to make sure that the goals that we developed are really consistent for all the local governments. And we could develop that consensus for how we're evaluating the criteria. Uh, and I will also say that this criteria was developed uh, in concert with the Technical Coordinating Committee. We went to them at two formal committees and we also had two standalone virtual workshops with the TCC to make sure that everyone, uh, there, there was broad support for the criteria that we put forward from our local government partners. And then what we're gonna propose to do is instead of having a strict, uh, you know, uh, point-based scoring uh, that we advance the projects to you for consideration and say numbers one through 30, we'd like to advance them in ranges. Uh, we've proposed some scoring ranges that bring you into a high, medium, high, medium, or low category. And the reason that we'd like to do this is that we'd like to have the ability to ensure geographic equity when we award these, pro these projects uh, and advance them to the priority list and also some modal equity as we advance projects. We don't wanna you know, ha open up the priority list for new projects and add a bunch of roadway projects or a bunch of just ITS projects. We'd like to have a good mix um, of modal priority as we move forward. This, is, um, an ex this shows what the proposed scoring for the multimodal priorities, uh, how the weighting will, will, will work out. Uh, we have uh, quite a few different criteria for each of uh, these goals. Uh, so improving safety would get about 25% of the weighting. Uh, and this will include you know, points for if the project uh, uh, is on an uncontrolled access facility where the speed limit is 35 miles or less or if the speed limit is greater than 35 miles an hour, you know, does the project provide um, um, a physical separation for non-motorized transit? Uh, so 25% of the points would go to considerations like that. For equity and health, that's about 22% of the points. And that will provide considerations for, is the project in an area with a high concentration or low, of low income or minority population? Or does the project improve mobility to a USDA designated low income and low access census tract. For example, about 18% of the weighting would go towards uh, mobility. So if the project is intended to improve traffic flow, and this could include uh, capacity projects on the roadway, but also if it provides an alternative to a single occupant vehicle. So if it imp improves transit service, well, that would improve mobility. Uh, so it would get points there. Or if it was a technology improvement, that would also improve mobility. So it would get points here. Uh, economic impacts would be about 15% of the points. Uh, that could include if the project improves mobility on the US-19 corridor, uh, improves access to the beaches, or, or includes ac or improves access to the gateway area. About 10% of the points would go towards environmental improvements and protection, and that would include if the project is intended to improve air quality through less idling, or if it avoids or minimize, minimizes wetland impacts and then also about 10% for resiliency. And that would include if the project improves mobility on a designated evacuation route, or if there are considerations for the impacts of sea level uh, rise and inundation. And then there are some other considerations that you'll see here on the right-hand side, which could include the readiness of the project, the countywide significance of the project, and also very importantly, the public and local government support for the project. We want to give additional consideration to projects that have very strong uh, support from not just the sponsoring local government, but also local governments surrounding it. I apologize. I'm trying to advance your slide right now. Oh, there we go. So for the next steps, um, today we'd be seeking board approval of this process to identify new projects for our multimodal priority list. We'd be issuing a call for projects over the summer. 
Here's a, a better timeline. Uh, we'd be issuing a call for projects, not just for this list, but also for our transportation alternatives program, which targets bicycle and pedestrian uh, projects of a small scale, our complete streets grant program, and also this one. We then have applications due uh, around December timeline, reviewing those over uh, the winter uh, the winter months. And then we would be bringing the re revised uh, projects to you in March of next year for final approval. Uh, then pivoting from that, uh, what we'd like to do is, since we've really aligned this process with you know, the goals and percent weighting, we want to make sure that we also develop some performance metrics so that we can ensure that the projects that we are um, advancing really have the desired outcomes that we're seeking. So we're proposing to develop uh, some of these performance metrics over the coming months, uh, metrics to improve safety, looking at possibly the rate or the number of crashes. We'd also look, like to look at how we're improving equity and health throughout Pinellas County, and some possible metrics that we could look at include income of households along our investment corridors that we identified through Advantage Pinellas, and also crash rates in our low income and minority areas compared to averages. Uh, jobs and households within a quarter mile of transit as a metric to show how we're improving mobility countywide. If we're fostering economic growth by looking at percent of jobs and population in our investment corridors, and then some other metrics that you can see there to protect the environment and show how we're improving resiliency countywide. Now, I know that was a lot of information to, to throw your way. I'd like to open it up for any questions. And then ultimately, we would be seeking a recommendation of approval uh, from this board today. Mr. Chairman, if I could just add real briefly that um, we're not proposing to rescore and remove projects that are already on the priority list. So just to be clear about that, things that are already priority are priority. Um, and then, you know, we're going to test run this and we may find that we need to make some tweaks and adjustments to this in a year or two. And, you know, we'll walk you along through that process. Okay. Sarah, any... Uh... Any questions? Yep, I'm seeing a couple. Go Mayor ahead. Bujowski has her hand raised. Mayor. Thank you, um, and thanks for the presentation. Um, is this a similar process as the, what the Dunedin Skinner Boulevard project went through? Um, it'll be a little bit different. Um, the Dunedin Skinner went through our Complete Streets program, and that did not have kind of hard and fast scoring. It was a little bit more open-ended uh, and, and qualitative. Uh, this is this has very strict scoring that would go into it and be considered against other projects. Okay, so then my, my next question is, um, whether it's for you, Chelsea, or for WIT, um, do we as a board, can we as a board promote a project that is a little bit more multi-jurisdictional to add into this group? Do we have that option? So the, the, the way that we propose to advance the projects in those buckets does allow for some consideration of other factors that come up. It doesn't, the scoring that we'll present that, that so we're going to score each of the projects and it'll come up in a, in a rank order. The scoring doesn't, doesn't basically wedge you to putting, okay, this was number one, number one has to go first, number two has to come next. The way that we propose to advance it, you'll have some flexibility in which projects you put forward and, not, and, and which ones you do not. Right, but you're counting on municipalities submitting these projects. Correct. And so what I'm asking is can this board forward Pinellas submit a project that we deem fit, that fits these criteria. Let me give you an example, um, waterborne transportation. We have not had our subcommittee meetings or anything, but we all know that this is an issue that crosses multi-jurisdictional lines. We want it to cross multi-jurisdictional lines. And, um, you know, if we're talking about multi visiting multi jurisdictions with with one um, contracted out waterborne transportation entity, um, that to me would be the perfect kind of project to fit into here because it takes that single user car out of the mix. Mm -hmm. It can also be I can also think of another project, and that would be taking the jolly trolley 
and making it um, half hour service instead of an hour service so that we can get more people where we need to get them, thereby reducing congestion um, and single user uh, vehicles. And I can see um, combining the two where, where you would make a connection between um, the Jolly Trolley and this waterborne transportation. Um, so both of those things sort of reduce congestion, reduces the single user um, automobile. Um, and that is something that I think an agency can bring forward mm -hmm. versus a municipality, because you're trying to cross, you're trying to create something that works for multiple locations. So I'd like at least to ha see, have that ability where an agency, whether it be Forward Pinellas or PSTA or whoever, can bring it forward. So, so this app, uh, this process is not just limited to municipalities. It is open to all government uh, agencies that have some kind of operating or uh, implementation jurisdiction within Pinellas County. So it is open to FDOT, PSTA, and TBARDA. Uh, the issue I would see with Ford Pinellas submitting is that we are not an implementing agency. Uh, so we would right. need someone to be the project sponsor to receive the funding. Like and I understand that, and that's kind of, I know what we'll speak to it, but I mean, that's kind of what we were going to start talking about in our waterborne transportation subcommittee. Um, but I just don't want to have to see it with just one municipality. It, 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 go ahead. Well, we, if I can answer that, um, Chelsea did outline that we give additional points or credits for multi-jurisdictional projects right. in this. So if that's part of it, then that'll help. The other thing that we can do at a staff level is really assess um, the willingness and the readiness of uh, multiple local governments to come forward with a project application together. And we can encourage that uh, with board direction or even just because we think that that could be a good project. What we won't be able to do though is fund operations um, because we do not have the ability to direct operating dollars, such as you mentioned, the increased frequency of the Jolly Trolley. Um, that's something that you know, would have to be a decision that either a local government makes or PSTA makes. These are really for capital projects as opposed to operating projects. Except that increasing the timing of the Jolly Trolley requires significant capital. Well, and you're going to add a number a, of trolleys in order to, to do the job. Then, then we could fund that part of it. We could, we could fund the bus or vehicle purchase of that. But what, what I do think at a staff level is, you know, where we, I think, work best is behind the scenes, working with our partners to identify opportunities, uh, gauge interest, and, and we have done that with the waterborne transportation. Um, I think City of Clearwater was going to submit an application last year, but I think the timing was a little too quick for them. Uh, for that, they may be back. And, you know, that's a project that we would be happy to sit down and scope with them but they're going to have to submit it. They're going to have to be behind the project and, and whether that's multiple cities uh, jointly or one city taking the lead, but having uh, an agreement with the other jurisdiction. Either way. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else? I see no other board members with their hands raised. All right, can you check to see if anybody from the public would like to speak to this item? Yes, any members of the public wishing to address the board, please raise your hand by pressing the raised hand button or hit star nine on the phone if you're calling in. Commissioner Eggers, I see no members of the public wishing to speak on this item. All right, thank you, Sarah. And I need a motion for approval of this process, please. Move approval, Mr. Chair. Second. Okay, we have a motion. Elders, yeah. I have a motion by Commissioner Long and a second by Vice Mayor Albritton. Okay. Mayor Bujowski. Aye. Commissioner Donovan. Yes. Vice Mayor Sofer. Aye. Vice Mayor Albritton. Aye. 
Commissioner Smith? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Mayor Kennedy? Yes. Council Member Rice? Yes. Commissioner Welch? Aye. Council Member Gabbard? Yes. <clears throat> Commissioner Seal? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. And Commissioner Eggers? Aye. And the ayes, uh, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that. Um, we'll move on to um, item 5E. I'm kind of excited to hear from Amy um, Elmore this afternoon about our communications roadmap and uh, kind of a, a, a and the monthly report on what's been going on. Uh, again, welcome, Amy, uh, and uh, look forward to your report. Sorry about that. There she is. There I am. Hi, Amy. Hi, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here with you guys this afternoon. And uh, thank you for the, the great introduction. Um, and I'm excited to present to you guys uh, what I'm calling a communications roadmap, uh, which I developed with the Forward Pinellas team. And this is really designed to give us kind of that 30,000 foot view for all of our communications, uh, showing where we currently are, where we want to go, and setting objectives so that we can get there. So in your agenda packet, you'll find this roadmap. Uh, please feel free to follow along, but also uh, to review this in more detail and let me know if you have any suggestions or ideas. So we know that currently we have a wide variety of audiences from local governments and planners to key stakeholders, businesses, and residents. And we also use many different platforms to reach these audiences, specifically excelling in community outreach events, social media, and collaborating with many other organizations. After speaking with the Forward Pinellas team, as well as several members of the board, we identified some key ideas uh, that we, we really determined we'd like to see throughout all of our communications efforts, including presenting information in an understandable way, meeting the public where they are, and supporting the internal culture of the team. I've also worked to create a one-year and a three-year plan to achieve some specific objectives. Some of the current priorities are to create an outreach improvement strategy for underserved communities uh, and revamp our website to be more transparent and user-friendly. And already our team has achieved several of these key objectives. Um, for example, I've created an Instagram account, implemented a social media and blog schedule, published news releases for regional and local reporters, and we've even created an internal website where the team can easily collaborate no matter where they're working. So this has been really nice to have um, when we, some have been working from the office and others have been working from, from home. But eventually we really wanna see our social media and our blog posts grow significantly and see also an increase in educational programming as well as our partnership events. Our blogs, which are developed by many of our team members as well as some of our partners can really help with transparency, but it also provides that educational outreach and information to our community so we hope that through our blogs and social media, we can encourage that two-way engagement with our community. And with our educational programs and partnership events, these allow us to go where the communities are and build those relationships. But the success of Forward Pinellas involves everyone, and we need your help to keep Pinellas moving forward. You can follow us on social media, sign up for our blog, 
and invite us to come and speak at your webinars and meetings. Um, if you're holding virtual town meetings, myself or Sarah could come and share something on Safe Streets Pinellas. Um, or Jared and Chelsea could come and give a virtual tutorial on the interactive transportation improvement plan, which is a really cool feature, I think myself. Um, uh, I'd even be happy to come and talk about this communications roadmap. So now that we've talked about that 30,000 foot uh, view, uh, let's bring it back down to kind of that 10,000 foot view. Each month in your informational items, you'll be able to find a monthly communications report that defines our metrics and keeps our team on track with our goals. So in May, 6,500 people viewed our Forward Pinellas website and we noticed an increase of viewers the day of the board meeting, actually. And you know, when I first started in March, we were reaching probably between around five and 7,000 people with our social media. And in May, we reached over 18,000 people through Facebook and Twitter. We also had 1,200 people that viewed our blogs. The team did five interviews with local media and we participated in over 30 public meetings. And just for future reference, we haven't tracked this data monthly. So now we can use this as a baseline and each month you'll be able to follow along and see how we're hitting our target. Um, and the way we're gonna be able to use this data is not just for tracking. After we have enough data, we'll be able to use this to see what's working, what's not working and stay on top of new trends, make sure that we're utilizing our resources and really staying at the forefront of our communication strategy. We're gonna be able to reach more people, more demographics, engage our underserved communities um, and reach out to these other segments of our population. So ultimately we'll be able to stay ahead of our trends and curves increase communications to people from all walks of life and get those people in our community into our decision-making processes and create that strategic plan that really reflects the community. Um, and we, we also, you know, we've explored that 30,000 foot view, that 10,000 foot view, but the ground level, you know, this communication data is so much bigger than just numbers. It really shows how we can reach our communities and ensure that they are a part of the planning process. So thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Amy, thank you um, for that. I mean, but one of the things I've always thought is no matter how good we think we communicate in government, we probably don't do nearly as good a job as we think we do. Um, and even when we do a really good job, we have a long way to go and still improve more. So I think social, obviously social media is the way to go. We've not necessarily been a big part of that over the years. So it's already great to see the increased numbers and um, look forward to really being a steady, a steady influence, if you will, in terms of getting information out and trying to engage, as you said, our public on things. That's, to me, it's the most important thing that we can do is trying to get our public engagement Gage. Everybody's so darn busy that just getting their attention so that they can give some thought to uh, these are really important matters that we're dealing with, but sometimes it, it just kind of goes by. So I think this is great stuff, and I'm looking forward to uh, your continued work. And uh, I know you've been out reaching out to all the board members as well, and uh, look forward to hearing uh, uh, kind of what you're hearing uh, from us collectively at some point down the road. So anyway, uh, yes, looks, like, looks like Commissioner Welch is up. That's what I'm seeing. Is that the first one, Sarah? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And great, great job, Amy. It's great speaking with you. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Um, just love the presentation. Just curious, which uh, social media followers do you cover the most? Um, do I covet? Yeah. You said. <laughs> <laughs> so is it the Facebook folks, Twitter, Instagram, which ones are most important? Are they all equal? They're absolutely all equal. I okay. will say we have different audiences depending on the different platforms. So our Facebook followers are more naturally um, kind of the 30 years, 30 years and up, 
usually the you know working parents with kids that sort of thing our twitter followers are going to be a lot of business owners and politicians and then our instagram followers are going to be a little bit more in the younger range and that's where we're really going to get a hold of those first time voters that sort of thing so those demographics are all extremely important um, just naturally in the type of work that that we do i think we will see more a more significant presence on facebook okay well i would love to see the chairman on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> if you can work that in i'd love to see that <laughs> we'll i'll see what i can work out on that i'll cool. see what i can do <laughs> 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 Sarah, anybody else? I see no other board members with their hands raised. Okay. Um, and then obviously this is just kind of an update, but I would like to see if there's anybody at the public that would like to, uh, to weigh in on this. Any members of the public who wish to address the board, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button in Zoom <clears throat> or star nine if you dialed in on the phone. Commissioner Eggers, I see no members of the public wishing to speak on this item. Thank you, Sarah. I'm sure I'm sure that'll be changing as we go down the road on this. So again, thank you, Amy, for your update. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Uh huh. And we're going to move on to WIT's director's report. We've got a few things here that uh, are going to take our uh, thought and uh, time. So WIT, uh, without further ado, get us started, please. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going <clears> to <throat> share my screen and. For the first uh, couple of items, we will be taking some public comment. For the latter part of the items, we won't. This is just for information only. I wanted to start with uh, the Indian Shores drainage and sidewalk issue that we've been following. And I gave an update to you last, last meeting uh, in, in early June. Uh, we've since had a couple of workshops with the town of Indian Shores. And uh, I expect we will hear um, relatively soon again from the mayor seeking um, prioritization of funding for uh, a sidewalk project um, that's bigger than what we are um, able to do with this drainage project. And I've shown on my screen on the right, the limits of um, where the mayor and the town council would like to have a sidewalk built uh, from 191st Avenue to Whitehurst Avenue, just south of the transition into Indian Rocks Beach. And the issue there, as you can see from the pictures on the left, uh, this is after um, a typical summer rain event, and you can see the ponding that's occurring on the shared bicycle and pedestrian path. That's pretty mild ponding uh, by my observations and I think most people's experience. And so what that does is, uh, especially in a constrained situation like on the lower and, and top photograph, is that people will walk out into the road <clears throat> or ride out into the road, and it creates a real hazardous situation with those ponds. And in addition, when somebody is traveling down Gulf Boulevard and the vehicle in front of them is turning left and there's a long strain of cars coming the other way, there's no barrier. And so the vehicle will make a right uh, to pass that car and they may or may not be able to see an oncoming pedestrian or a family of four or cyclists or whatever. So uh, we haven't had a lot of crashes or fatalities along this stretch, but the police chief and, and many of the council members, and I'm kind of in agreement, it's probably a matter of time if that behavior continues. So the Department of Transportation has uh, about a uh, $8 million drainage project that's underway in Indian Rocks Beach and in Indian Shores. Uh, they are gonna fix about 70% or so of these ponding issues, but it's not a complete fix. Uh, and it'll deal with more of the regular storm events as opposed to the, the major storm events. Um, but they were not able to work out uh, a solution to building a sidewalk with a vertical curb, which is uh, what the mayor and town council wanted to better differentiate the, um, the sidewalk as not being um, a place to drive your vehicle. Um, but what the department has come up with as a, as a recommendation is to have green pigment paint uh, incorporated into the, the, the pavement where the pedestrians and cyclists operate, which is similar to what we have to the south um, along Gulf Boulevard through the communities of the Reddingtons and 
uh, down into the Madeira Beach area and Treasure Island. The, um, that project would be funded by the department and built as part of the drainage project. Uh, I'm told by the department that that will continue through the Indian Rocks Beach section where the similar treatment uh, exists north of Indian Shores. So you'll have continuity of pavement markings through that segment. They will add additional signage and pavement markings as part of that improvement. Uh, the mayor and town council have a meeting tomorrow that I will attend. Uh, just be aware they are inviting Senator Brandis and Representative DeSegley to that meeting. Uh, I believe they will be there or their representatives. And I suspect they're going to be looking for some additional state funding to advance uh, this major project. Uh, to the mayor's uh, credit, um, you know, he's um, been a real bulldog on this issue because it has been on our collective radar screen since uh, the early 2000s. It's been almost 20 years and the sidewalk still hasn't been built. And my understanding, this all happened before I was here, is that, um, that it was not funded because of the high cost of the project. Um, so we have an old cost estimate that is in the neighborhood of about 15 million. The Department of Transportation tells me that it's probably higher than that and maybe as much as 30 million. So what I'm suggesting uh, based on the department's recommendation is that we seek funding in the next several years for um, a PD&E reevaluation uh, to go back in and work with the town, work with the community and come up with a, a viable, financially feasible option that the town supports uh, that, that is buildable um, and then figure out what that cost of that project will be and then um, seek funding for the larger project. We estimate that that reevaluation is probably on the order of $500,000. Um, if we can get that funding in place in the next several years, then I think we could continue to hold uh, the sidewalk and drainage project as a priority. It's already on our priority list, but we would have a better sense of exactly what we're looking to fund. And whether it's 30 million or 15 million, then this board and the Department of Transportation and the town would be better in a better position, I think, to have a a shared understanding of uh, how to seek funding and how high to prioritize the project. Um, so I'll leave it there and see if anybody has any questions about this project and we'll open it up to see if there are any public comments. So Whit, um, I, I see Karen's hand going up. So Karen, uh, Commissioner Seal, go ahead um, with your question. Okay, so my question is, um, so are they, doing the $8 million fix at the present time, and would that continue? Yes, that will continue. That project is underway, and again, that'll solve a, a good chunk of the drainage issues out there. Okay, my next um, question and or comment, and I would imagine um, Mayor Kennedy may wanna weigh in on this, but um, you know, when this project, and I have history on, on this, and I just, <clears throat> Remember that this was, uh, the vaults were built for the drainage. We were worried about the sand and the accumulation. So obviously that's happened, but it's also happening in Indian Rocks Beach. Mm -hmm. So I, if we're gonna reevaluate this, then you need to do the corridor in its entirety. That makes sense, yes. You agree, Mayor Kennedy? She's, it looks to be frozen. Oh, no, movement. <laughs> She's still muted. Mayor Kennedy, there you yeah. go. Uh, yes, that, that's what I was gonna mention, going to mention was the fact that, you know, we would also want Indian Rock Speech. Uh, and I'm aware that to the best of my knowledge, it is, we are included, correct? It? Yes, the, the, the department tells me that the green pigment um, sort of the interim fix would continue through the IRB section as well. And yes, we that all goes up to Whitehurst, I believe, which doesn't go all the way to um, Almerton Road. I was just highlighting the section in Indian Shores on this map, but the drainage project goes much further north. It goes into right the now. Narrows. It goes, to the narr it goes through the Narrows up to Almerton? Yes, it does. Okay, because I think, Again, Mayor Kennedy, you'll have to help 
probably with this, but I believe that was the improvements on Golf Boulevard that was done several years ago with the vaults was from Almerton South through Indian Shores, correct? Correct. Okay. So north of Almerton was constructed differently? Yes. So we don't have the same treatment north of Almerton. We have a, it's not really a full bike lane, but it's striped. Uh, and um, that's, that's under county um, control in that section. This is okay. state maintained roadway. Okay, and just another comment. Um, I understand why people would want it. Where would, would the vertical curb be actually past the bike lane, so closest to the property, or are they proposing that the vertical curb be put um, right by Golf Boulevard to separate the bikes and the pedestrians? So um, there's right of way for a portion of this to fit the sidewalk in today to the south. When you get further north, uh, you don't have right of way. Uh, it's really constrained. What uh, we've talked about is having a wide sidewalk that would be about eight feet wide that would accommodate both pedestrians and bicyclists. That's about the minimum width to do that. And the faster bicyclists that get out there and ride in groups on Saturday and Sunday will probably use the travel lane. They're doing that today. Uh, most bicyclists who are going over 10 or 15 miles an hour don't really want to ride in the existing shared facility that's out there because there's a lot of up and down on it mm -hmm. when they go to every transit stop for ADA compatibility. Um, so the faster you move, the more you're in the roadway. Correct, but I guess I just have a concern about a vertical uh, curb for safety for bicyclists. So I, you know, I understand the thought process behind it, but I'm worried about the safety. Sure. We, you already highlighted there are safety concerns already. I think the big issue that the town wants with that vertical curb is to just better differentiate that it's a sidewalk and it's not part of the roadway. There are other ways of doing that. And so that's what the department came up with in terms of the green pigment. Um, we also talked about um, having some kind of audible um, uh, uh, markings in the, in the roadway that would create a noise if the driver drifted over, but the department's recommending against those because they really only put them on rural roadways. They get a lot of complaints for the noise and most bicyclists don't like those either because they can create a safety hazard. Um, you could also look at flex posts and things like that, but again, bicyclists don't like those because it constrains your ability to get out of the bike lane if you wanted to go to the coffee shop, for instance, along there. So I think we're coming up with like the best workable solution that we can given the project that's underway. Uh, so the reevaluation would give us the ability to to reimagine what the real project is and how much support there is, because I think the town ran into some roadblocks with the sidewalk but from the business owners, because there's been a lot of encroachment into the right of way out there, mm -hmm. whether it's been a fence or a wall or outdoor dining or things like that. And um, people weren't happy. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mayor Kennedy. I just wanted to add concerning the, the green pigment that I think it was with how many years ago that we started the green pigment all the way down from St. Pete Beach and brought it up. And I, it's been successful having the green pigment and, you know, through Golf Boulevard. So bringing it farther down Golf Boulevard, I think is a really good idea. Yeah, that, that was 2017. And the difference between that and this is that's only in the conflict areas where you have Right. Um, uh, a right turn or a driveway or an in intersecting street. Um, this would be for the whole length of, of this section. Not which which I think is a great idea. I think that's a great idea. And mentioning Mayor Pat, and I don't know if he's on the phone. Is he going to make a comment? If he is, I don't know. Uh, has been really out in front trying to make this happen. And especially about the safety issues that surround Indian Shores. Uh, and, and so with that being said, we'll be at the meeting tomorrow to um, see if there's another more solutions that we can come up with for the area of his community, that, that entire area of his community. Wit. 
Um, so the idea now is to move, obviously you're moving forward with this project to do some of the interim, uh, I guess I call it interim changes and to seek funding to do a more um, complete PD&E or do a PD&E um, to, uh, to assess what really needs to be done in the long run. Um, is there is there an alternative to that? I mean, is that is that what um, the, the the mayor and the commissioner? Well, I, I, well I, I mentioned this to the mayor and town council when I was um, on the call at their last town council meeting, and I think they understood that you know that reevaluation isn't another roadblock. It's it's actually helping them better define the project so that we know how much money we're seeking and we can define the project and not get surprised later. Um, I think if they go for a legislative earmark now, um, there's a lot of risks with that. If, if, a, if an earmark is not worded exactly right, then the department is really limited in spending that money only on what the earmark specifically says. And we had that issue a couple of years ago where we got an earmark for design. And really what we needed was money for uh, planning and alternatives analysis for the, for the Memorial Causeway Bridge and not a design. Um, and, and so that project ended up not really going anywhere um, because we didn't build consensus by looking at all the alternatives. So be real careful with earmarks. And then the other thing is if the earmark is funded, um, that, that kind of undermines our prioritization process because that jumps to the top and the department doesn't really have any reserves. So they look to other projects in the district and in Pinellas County that they may need to take money from in order to fund the earmark. And um, that's a risk to everything that's on the priority list. Uh, and then if it's vetoed by the governor, then we can't revisit it for at least a year. Um, so the earmark process is dicey. Um, you can say all you want about, let's pull it from the general fund and not the transportation trust fund. But when they get into the budget process, um, we lose a lot of control. Okay, so, thank uh, you. Um, hope for the best. Yeah, Any, anybody else? Uh, well, um, Sarah, could you check to see if um, the mayor or anybody else is online that would like to speak? Yes. Any members of the public who wish to address the board on this, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button in Zoom, or if you're on the phone, dial star nine. Commissioner Eckers, I see no members of the public wishing to speak on this item. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Uh, Witt, if there's nothing else, let's move on to um, uh, B uh, or the uh, number two, A, A2, please. Okay, uh, so the next one, and are you seeing my screen still? Or do we need to go back? Um, I don't see your screen, no. Let's go back. Yep, it's coming. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, we have a, a design project uh, underway um, on US 19 from 580 to County Road 95. And this is for a pedestrian, well, it's for an interchange, uh, grade separations. And uh, you can see here from 580 on my left part of the screen in the upper corner, that's an existing interchange. Curly Road will have uh, a new interchange built as part of this project. Uh, County Road 95 is just north of Curly Road. Um, Northside Drive will have a pedestrian overpass bridge, and at Boy Scout Road, there will be a U-turn overpass, so that'll be for vehicles to, to cross between the frontage roads. Uh, Republic Drive, where there is an existing traffic signal, that signal will go away, uh, and that'll just have access to the frontage roads. Uh, the Department of Transportation has been working based on the direction of this board um, to put in pedestrian crossings every uh, quarter mile on the future US 19 as it gets built going north. For this road segment, they could not accommodate a quarter mile spacing, so they were looking at half mile spacing of those pedestrian crossings. And what they have come up with is a pedestrian throughway or an underpass just south of Republic Drive. Uh, we had um, some uh, local businesses in this area. Um, car dealership, um, uh, hotel, bowling alley, and some other businesses along this area that were concerned about that pedestrian throughway from a um, visibility standpoint of their businesses, that it would obstruct the views and 
um, other concerns that nobody is out there walking today and it's, it's, it's not worth the money to spend to, to put that in there. Um, what the department has done is they've created a series of video animations, which I'm not gonna show right now, but it's in your agenda packet and everybody who's watching the median meeting can click on these items in the agenda and review what I think are some really fantastic um, video animations of the completion of the project after it's done. Um, what uh, this image on the right shows is the elevation of the pedestrian throughway. It's about 12 feet higher, um, whereas you're looking at something on the order of 30 uh, or so feet higher for the, for the vehicle overpasses. Um, the reason that they can't move the pedestrian throughway a little bit to the north or to the south to accommodate uh, these business owners' concerns is that that enters into a geometric conflict with the on and off ramps for US 19 to access the frontage roads. Um, so if we're going to meet the half mile spacing in this section, that's where the throughway has to be. Um, so we had a meeting uh, a little more than a week ago with the business owners and the Department of Transportation. They explained their rationale. We showed the, the animated videos. Um, I think they were still wanting to express their uh, opposition to the pedestrian throughway. Um, and we're still concerned that it was uh, not a justifiable expense. Um, my response to that is that, you know, we're planning infrastructure for 30 years or more. And uh, this US 19 corridor um, has shown in the past that it's not always gonna look the way it does today. And uh, we do see that there is market demand for additional residential development in this corridor. Uh, not necessarily all right here, but uh, certainly along this corridor, there's a potential for as many as 2,500 additional residential units without any land use changes. Um, so um, we would like to see the spacing adhered to rather than going back um, after the fact, um, several years later, like we're doing at Harn Boulevard and building a much more expensive overpass. Um, but uh, this is really something that the department is doing at, at the Ford Pinellas' board direction. Um, they did promise in our last meeting to go back in and look at the Harn Boulevard issue um, to see how the demand for pedestrian crossings changed once the elevated overpasses, the grade separated overpasses were constructed because back when that project was first started, Harn Boulevard wasn't a high demand area, but then as the overpasses were built and other options for crossing were limited, uh, it became a much more high demand area and we actually had fatalities out there because people were jumping the barriers and crossing US 19 on foot. Um, so we may have some comments uh, from the public on this item, uh, but I did want to just bring this to your attention. This is not for action today, but if you wanted to provide any different direction to the department, um, what we could do is schedule something uh, in, in September. Um, with just, just real quickly on the um, pedestrian overpass versus the pedestrian throughway. Is there a rationale for one over the other? I mean, I heard you say that the pedestrian overpass is expensive. Um, assuming it's much more expensive than than the throughway. The big um, issue is uh, right of way cost. So there's a pretty big chunk of right of way that the state is paying Pinellas County uh, for that uh, overpass at Northside Drive uh, because that's county owned, owned property in that area. Um, the other issue is usage. Uh, we do not see nearly the amount of use for pedestrian overpasses when they're built. Uh, they're expensive and they're not used very often because of ADA um, typically factoring into the design. You have to get those circular ramps built um, and uh, it's a much longer distance to travel. And if there's no other option, they get used, um, but I've seen them built and, and uh, people tend to avoid them. An underpass, sure is um, much easier to navigate. So I'm assuming that that was considered, the underpass was, the, the throughway was considered at north side. It just didn't work um, from a geometric perspective. Uh, well, that's also a, a community trail connector to the Pinellas Trail, to the Duke Energy Trail. So that'll be how they access that new segment that's being built north of Countryside Boulevard. 
I'm not sure how far it goes west, but that'll be a connector into the Duke Energy. Yeah, it doesn't, it, it doesn't go that far west. I mean, it goes to the Duke Energy Trail and it goes east. Right. East right. to- Right, it goes uh, east, but it'll, it'll cross US-19 there. What will cross, what will cross US-19? That pedestrian overpass at Northside Drive, that'll oh. be the connector into the Duke Energy Trail. But it doesn't go to US-19. Uh, yeah, there'll be a there'll be a trail connection of some type. I'm not exactly sure what it'll how it'll be configured, but it will connect to the Duke Energy Trail from that overpass. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I'm not sure how far west it'll go from US 19. I don't think it'll go west at all very far. Okay. All right. Okay, uh, are there, I, I see um, any board members, first of all, that had any questions for WIT? And we, we can come back. I know that there are uh, at least one or a couple people who might want to speak to this. So, uh, Sarah, if we can, uh, if you don't see any board members, uh, then let's go to the public and get their, their comments. I see no board members. Any members of the public wishing to speak on this item, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom or press star nine if you're on the phone. I do see we already have two hands raised. Anyone else who wishes to speak, please raise your hand as well. Members of the public, you will have three minutes to speak on this. And I see Karen Mullins first, followed by Todd Pressman and then J.M. Roberts. Karen, I'm allowing you to speak now. Hi, Karen, welcome. Hi, hi Commissioner. Um, thanks for letting me speak. I just wanted to give a um, history on the Harm Boulevard um, overpass, you know, the retrospect there. People were using that a lot. Um, there were some people killed after the overpass went in. Um, I was a PSTA bus driver when that was being built. People were using the bus stop on both sides of the road to get to um, get to work and back. And they were also utilizing the community center on Harm Boulevard. So I don't understand why that wasn't in the in the study that was heavily used at that time. And that's why the CAC made it a priority to get the Harm Boulevard overpass built. I know that probably the pedestrian traffic has come down um, since then, because it's been quite a few years since that overpass has been built. I do have concerns on the north, uh, uh, north of 580. We need those underpasses. Um, pedestrians will, I've seen people walk across traffic and almost get killed uh, while I was driving the bus. People will cross US-19 and even if we will not be able, if they're not even slowing down at that point, um, we'll have overpasses and people will be going about 70 miles an hour because that's about the speed that it is now with the other overpasses. So I'd like to see the underpasses being built. Um, there are going to be, the density is going to be uh, much denser in that area in the future. And I don't want to see anybody get hurt up there. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Okay. We have Mr. Pressman next. Mr. Pressman, you have three minutes. You should now be able to speak. Hi, Todd. Mr. Chairman, before I begin, can you see me or is this just audio? Well, right now, it's, you, you can, uh, at the top of your screen, make it so that we can see you. We'd I, much I, believe, I believe, Commissioner Eggers, that um, attendees are not able to have video. Oh, uh, I stand corrected. Second, thank you, Sarah. Second question, uh, thank you. Second question is, can I share my screen? I'm sorry, oh. we don't have that set up at this time. Um, only presentations that are prepared in advance can be shared. We can collect okay. it. It's not do or die, but Mr. Chairman, if I may ask, I'm representing uh, the business group that what referred to. I was hoping I might be able to have a minute or two extra to get some information across the board members. Um, I'll give you five minutes. That'll be plenty. Mr. Uh, Chairman, Commissioner, um, and board members, mayors, commissioners, council members, Todd Pressman, uh, 200 2nd Avenue South and St. Petersburg number 451. Appreciate your attention on this item. As Witt has said, we've had a lot of discussions about this. I am representing a conglomerate of the businesses at this location, automotive, uh, hotels, um, 
significant businesses that are located in this area, which are gonna be very negatively impacted. Um, the issue quite frankly is the spacing for pedestrian crossing. And it's certainly understood at areas of US 19, pedestrian crossing is important. However, in this location, what we can tell you definitively by FDOT's own count, there is a de minimis demand for pedestrians. They uh, charted all pedestrian crossings from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. on one day in August. They had six people in one direction and five the other direction. I assume those are the same people. Um, the businesses that are located, and some will speak if they can get online, they're having difficulty. They've told and directed Mr. Blanton that they are there every day. Some have been there for decades, and there are just no people seeking to cross the roadway. Uh, these are businesses that are uh, drawn customers to their sites, like a transmission shop, a hotel, and dealerships. So people are not venturing and walking to these businesses. Um, this intersection also already has a dedicated traffic light and crosswalk. So we know now, and when FBOT took the count, what the demand would be. And with great respect to Mr. W to, to uh, Witt, uh, and I do mean great respect, the zoning in this area is very intensive. From the city Clearwater at Main Street North, it is commercial parkway, which is one of their most intensive zoning categories, which means commercial businesses. From Main Street South, it is all um, regional center zoning by the city of Clearwater, obviously very intensive and all business oriented. I would disagree strenuously that these are not gonna be residential properties, nor in the media vicinity. There is no demand for it now, as, as indicated in the FDOT count that WIT has seen, and there will be none in the future. Our answer to the staff and concerns about people crossing the street is to do what FDOT does everywhere. And that is they raise a barrier fence. You can find that at more than dozens all along busy roadways where they erect a very high fence so that pedestrians will not cross. What pedestrians minimally, the few less than a handful will do is they will walk down to the mall area. There's a crossover at 580, which is before the mall and they will simply walk around that structure. So in summary, board members, very simply, pedestrian crossings are necessary and they provide safety. But at this particular and specific location, it's not warranted. The taxpayer money is not warranted and the negative effects on the businesses are not warranted. So what we would ask you to do with all due respect, we'd ask you to direct your staff in a consensus manner for no pedestrian underpass at the site or to determine alternatives recognizing the de minimis demand of this location, waste of taxpayer money and negative impacts to the business. We appreciate your attention, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, we have one more person wishing to speak on this, J.M. Roberts. If you could please identify your name and then you'll have three minutes to speak. I'm allowing you to talk now. Mr. Roberts? Yes, this is Tom Layton. I'm the uh, general manager for Roberts Collision Center here. We're on the east side of US 19 across the street from Loki, uh, Kia, Volkswagen, Nissan. Uh, I've been here personally myself for 21 years. Um, we sit out front here and watch people and I've got one or two people, one that walks the dog up 19 and back. They live in the condos to the north, but there's no people. Uh, I mean, this is a, this is a dealership turned into a, a high-end collision center. I mean, uh, it's already been spoken across the street. If we ever decide to sell, the Lokis want it to expand their operation already. Right next door is an extremely expensive uh, bowling facility that a tremendous amount of money has been spent. And the other properties that John Roberts leases are up, has some frontage and we have warehouse in the back. Selling it is not an option. There, there is no other residential. This is not a residential area now. And I, I don't understand where they're thinking that this could possibly be a residential in the future. We, you know, we have Amco transmission next to us. 
Then a little bit farther down, you've got the corner that's got the bank and all the professional buildings. I mean, this is heavy. You know, this is commercial. This isn't commercial with a neighborhood right around the corner that, you know, we could have a, you know, we're going to have a condo uh, go up or anything. All of it is used, you know, this, and then this, this property is extremely expensive property for somebody to buy us all up and do it. It wouldn't even be feasible. There isn't uh, it'd be just too expensive. And we'd like you guys to, you know, to please reconsider the, the thought pattern we understand the safety option. It's in, in they obviously we we do have a demand for a place for people to to walk across. But you know, to the north right now at Republic Drive is where there is uh, residential behind where the two banks are on either corner. And we, as you go a little bit north, there are neighborhoods behind, but there isn't. You know, we don't have anything here. I mean, this is all commercial, and you know, we're, we're trying to keep, obviously, the visibility for our business here and the accessibility, you know, uh, for a thriving business. This has been a thriving business for a long time, and we don't want to be another casualty like so many of the other places to the south. I mean, uh, it ruined a lot of those businesses, which you guys already have the numbers. I mean, I'm not telling anything you don't know. And, I mean, we've got a lot of families here we feed and take care of and a, a, an immense customer base. So I don't know, we're, we're just asking you to please uh, take in consideration the fact of the actual location as it sits, you know, I'm sure Loki, uh, it, nobody could come up with enough money to buy that guy out across the street. Excuse it, me, your three minutes are up. If okay, Thank well, you. I appreciate Thank you taking you. a minute with yeah. us and uh, I, I hope that you can Please uh, reconsider the plan yep. and change your location. Appreciate your appreciate your checking in with us. Thank Is you. there anybody else, Sarah? I see no other members of the public wishing to speak on this item. Hey, uh, Wit, I had a question for you. You had said that you know we had kind of had a, a wish of having a, a an access point every quarter of a mile, and DOT could only accommodate every half mile on this on this particular stretch. And I also heard that there was a, a, a count done by FDOT. I mean, I think they're probably putting this pass in there to try to accommodate our kind of overarching um, direction about quarter mile, half mile. Would they normally at this particular juncture um, with the counts that they have do one on their own? Would they put, would they invest the money in this or um, is this just more to accommodate us? Yes, um, so they, I, I believe they did the count as part of the design work leading up to this. Um, what they promised to do at our last meeting with the property owners was to go back and look at uh, the historical change in pedestrian demand at the Harn Boulevard location because the department's project manager, who's a consultant, um, felt that the characteristics of the two locations were similar. Uh, that Republic Drive today looked a lot like Harn Boulevard before the overpass went in. And there was not a lot of demand at that Harn Boulevard uh, intersection before the overpass went in. And it constrained some of the crossing opportunities and therefore led to an increase in demand. So uh, I haven't seen that count data, but they were going to bring back that historical count. I'm not sure there's a lot of value in going out and doing another count because the property owners are, are right, um, you know, there's no demand today. Um, you know, there's an old joke out there that nobody built a bridge by counting the number of swimmers across the, the bay. Um, you know, so there's, there's a barrier to crossing. And I think we need to um, address the fact that US-19 has created a barrier for crossing, except where we put in the interchanges. And so that was the board's direction was to have a more permeable uh, corridor that could support redevelopment, which we know is inevitable, at least on parts of US-19. And we're not suggesting at staff level that there's redevelopment imminent or changes to housing imminent in this location. But, you know, the frontage of, of these fringe roads, the properties abutting it aren't very deep. And right behind them is a lot of residential. 
a lot of mobile homes and you're putting in the Duke Energy Trail less than half a mile to the east. So we think there's something over time that could lead to some additional increased demand. Um, Sarah, 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 I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt and wit. I just wanna let you know that we do have members of FDOT um, in attendance today. If there's questions that are, are best answered, I have Ed McKinney on, it looks like the secretary's on and Justin Hall are all on the line today if we have questions that they need to answer. Okay, yeah, I would, I, I'd like to get their take on it. I, I'm, I'm hearing from Witt that this is kind of our long range, um, I guess, uh, wish for things that could be developing in the next 10 to 20 years as opposed to in the next year to two. Um, and so you're just trying to, you know, cover, cover our base a little bit there. Um, uh, but if, if if there's an FDOT representative that could speak to that item as far as um, if, you know, would you guys normally seek to uh, build a connection there for pedestrians? Um, you know, if the member of FDOT who wishes to speak on this could please use the raise hand button so I know who is available to be called on. I can unmute you. Justin, I see you and I will allow you to talk. Hi, Justin. Hey, how are you doing? Uh, can Good. you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Good. Uh, so, you know, we've had a lot of conversations on this crossing and we've worked with uh, WIT and staff quite a bit. And we've also met with our traffic operations group, which looks into safety concerns, you know, throughout all of our, uh, our uh, FDOT owned facilities. One thing that we did notice out there, um, we are still pulling the historical counts for Harn because we did see that as a good comparison, um, similar facility, uh, pre-construction of the US-19 uh, separated or limited access facility, or sorry, controlled access. And so we're trying to look at those historic counts, but one thing we did observe, uh, the counts at the Republic Drive crossing are low. Um, that, that is true. One thing that does occur on US-19 in this area, because there is nothing to control or limit pedestrian crossing outside of the intersection, is pedestrians do cross mid-block. They, they really cross anywhere that they feel that they can. That's something that they would not be able to do uh, once US-19 is reconstructed with the controlled access. So the thought, with all of these underpasses, overpasses, any of the connections, even at the interchanges, is that the pedestrians will funnel um, path of least resistance uh, to the crossing locations. And I think that was some of the conversation before when the decision was made that we would try and provide crossings every quarter of a mile. And obviously in this area, it's hard to do them every quarter, so we have to do every half. It's that those pedestrians that now cross, you know, mid block that will run across they will then come to the uh, protected crossings. To answer your question, whether we would put in a pedestrian underpass for six to eight pedestrians, that's a really hard question to answer. Um, I think that there's more in depth analysis that would be done to determine whether we believe uh, from a safety standpoint that there needs to be a crossing there. I think in this situation, the decision was made by the board. And so we did not go into further analysis from a safety standpoint. Um, I think though we often come back and we ask, you know, what's the cost of a life and will the people, the six to eight people, will they walk a mile out of their way? Because if you, if you look at it, it would be a mile, a uh, mile out of their way to go to another business uh, where they're walking now or to go to transit access. Um, and just sorry, one other thing and I'll be done. We're also looking right now at the social equity because that's something else we have to look at is the communities that are both east and west of US-19, what is the demographic and sociographic makeup to make sure that we're not uh, taking away access for a population that you know needs the access? So that's... Yeah, right, but, but when, if this was taken out, you'd have a mile between the, the two access points, correct? Uh, the, if, if someone was gonna cross east to west, it would take them a mile out of their way. If they, well, uh, if they're at 580, they're going to cross at 580. Anywhere in between there, they're going to walk that distance to the the over the uh, I think it's automobile turnaround U-turn and 580, right? 
That's a, that's yes. a, is that a that's a mile apart. Yes, sir. It's a mile. So people aren't going mean, to. I guess if your your point is is they're going to have to go from that point down and across and then back up to a certain point across the street. I guess then it is a mile. But um, um, I, I I guess that that's what I wanted to hear from you. What you guys would normally do. It sounds like you guys didn't do the analysis there. You were kind of taking our lead on it. I sure would like to hear the Harn Boulevard conversation. Although this area here is significantly different in terms of commercial development. It does have residential infill behind it, but it's mostly townhome apartments, a uh, townhome and and single family homes, um, not not necessarily apartment complexes. Although, if you go further east, there are some um, mobile home parks. But um, anyway, I think there's some there's probably some other folks that have now. I can see three or four hand waving. So, uh, Sarah, is there somebody else that uh, is now wanting to speak to us? Yes. Commissioner Eggers, we have um, two members of the public who have already spoken who wish to speak again, if we will allow it, Mr. Pressman and then Ms. Mullins, and then we have two board members, Vice Mayor Albritton and Commissioner Seal, that have raised their hand as well. I'd like to hear from the board members first, and then, um, uh, Todd, I'll go back to you for a minute and a half. You'd use three and a half minutes. I said I'd give you five, so I'll give you a minute and a half. Karen, you didn't use all your time. I'll give you a, a minute just to kind of you know rebut anything you may have heard. So let's go to the board members first, if we can ask the, answer their questions, and then we'll go to the public. Okay, so Vice Mayor. People. Vice Mayor Albritton has hand raised first. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I I just wanted to to say that um, maybe in the past we had a uh, more of a comparative between Harn Boulevard and Republic. You know, and that first cut before 580 and Republic, but um, you know, definitely Harn Boulevard now with the, I mean, we've got a lot of apartments being built around there, and that's definitely a necessary pedestrian crossing. Uh, whereas now this this one up in north of 580, it's true, it's all uh, established commercial. Uh, I, I don't just, I don't see the necessity for the one there, especially, you know, now with, even with the residential behind it, um, you know, you've got a, a an established uh, commercial area that people come into with vehicles. Um, so I, I'd kind of be against, I'd like to take another look at that um, before approving that, that one that's between Republic and uh, and um, 580. Okay, Sarah, who who is next? Thank you, Councilman. Next, we have Commissioner Seal. Um, thank you. Um, while we're having this discussion, could we go back and put up the um, presentation, or at least the kind of the map of where everything was going to go? Sure. Can you see my screen now? Yep, thank you. The only comment I'm gonna make, and I do agree with um, Council Member Albritton that it might not, it is mostly commercial behind there, but then I'm gonna go back in history and say down near Harn on the east side of US 19, that was mostly commercial five years ago. And now it's all apartments. And as he stated, it is really needed there. Um, so it's hard to predict, as Witt has already said, what's gonna happen at for those properties five years from now, especially with COVID um, impacts and so on. Um, so the other point I wanna make is, many of you all may not remember, but I chaired a, US 19 Pedestrian Safety Task Force. And that was a direct result of a young woman being killed on US 19, um, trying to cross across from the east side to the west side. And um, we haven't had as many pedestrian deaths, thankfully, or bicyclist deaths as we were at one point on US 19. Um, so I just, kind of urge that as a cautionary um, note. 
and um, I looked at all of the uh, YouTube presentations, and I guess from a business perspective, it really doesn't do anything more to a business than the current overpasses do. So um, you at least look like you had some eye level, and if it's concern about people seeing their businesses, I think that still um, can take place with the proposed um, underpasses. So I don't know, I guess I'd like to continue to evaluate this and also understand what the final costs would be for um, these particular things. And then I'd also like, because I'm not sure the, the pedestrian overpass bridge at Northside, um, I'm trying to visualize how that's going to link into the Duke Energy Trail. So I know where the east it will, but uh, you know, I'm thinking on the west side. So if you could help me with that, that would be helpful. Thank you. We can work with the county on that, county staff. Okay. Commissioner Eggers, it looks like Commissioner Long has her hand raised as well. Okay, Commissioner Long. Uh, I think you're, are you muted? Janet? Can you tell Sarah? I can, I, Commissioner Long, I'm asking to unmute you. Um, let me exit the screen sharing and see if that will help. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, well, um, Good day. notice to proceed and the consultant is underway to do a preliminary engineering study. They're in the data gathering phase. Uh, what the department wants to do is to um, do a full analysis and vetting of the concepts that were approved by the Clearwater City Council uh, back, I believe, in 2018 uh, for the Drew Street Corridor. Um, and, you know, we've got multiple partners here because part of this road is maintained and, and operated and managed by Pinellas County. Part of it is Florida Department of Transportation and part of it is the city of Clearwater. Um, the project manager is Brian Schroyer. He would like to complete this in about nine months. Uh, there's been an extensive amount of public outreach done for the Clearwater Complete Streets project. So the department's not really doing an extensive public outreach, but they are working with uh, stakeholders. They'll be engaging um, the, the Chamber of Commerce and um, the, the local boards and, and city councils. Um, as you can see from the roadway, we've got a constrained section. This is west of the golf course in this picture around Betty Lane. And on the right side, the south side of the roadway, there's no sidewalk. Uh, the department has let us know earlier this week that they are working on closing the sidewalk gaps and expediting that uh, through um, uh, some kind of, of, of contract vehicle uh, or where they have the right of way. So in this section is part of the section where they would be adding sidewalks. And that's not dependent on the preliminary engineering study. So they're gonna go and tackle the sidewalks as quickly as, as they can get that vehicle in place. Um, they don't think that it'll be a lot of money, so that can be a, a push button type of contract. Uh, what the, the goal of this is to build consensus between the city of Clearwater, the county, um, presumably Ford Pinellas and the department on what is the best configuration for each segment of, US, of Drew Street, not US Main. Uh, and it changes character uh, depending on where you are on the roadway. So it's really just an update for you. Uh, but I do have um, uh, Mike Reardon as a citizen who's come before the board and he asked me to read something into the record. Uh, and I'll go ahead and do that. Um, so if you'll give me that just a minute, it's a short paragraph. Um, so it says uh, the bottom line, and this is from Mike Reardon, who's a city of Clearwater resident. The bottom line is Drew Street should not be dragging on like a normal project regarding some fast, easy steps to make it slower and calmer. Edgewater Drive got a speed reduction without a speed study. Anyone can see the state section of Drew should be 30 miles an hour, knowing most people will go 40 to 45 miles an hour. 
Right now, half the cars are going the average speed of 55 miles an hour, according to the Kimley Horn study. That was the Complete Streets project. I bike along the golf course section two to three times per week and can easily tell you that is true. Five blocks of a goat trail where the sidewalk has been missing for 40 plus years is still there. The city of Clearwater politicians couldn't care less and lied to the citizens for many decades. The state needs to just implement basic safety aspects, then expedite the entire streetscape plans. The city of Clearwater lost any say or feedback rights for not telling people the state won't fix the road. FDOT is guilty of not knowing what was happening or ignoring the situation, probably both over 40 years. It's been 10 months since I first brought this to the Ford Pinellas attention and over 15 years since I expressed concerns to the city multiple times. I'm tired of waiting, pandemic or not, we need to see action. So that's from Mike Reardon. I'll open it up to see if any of you all have any questions. Um, any questions from the, uh, the board? So uh, with, again, back to the preliminary engineering study, it's to be completed in nine to 10 months, you said? Yes. Okay. And that's the entire stretch, right? From uh, Osceola to US-19. Okay. It looks like Vice Mayor Alberton has his hand raised. Okay. Um, all right. Um, yeah, Council Member Albritton. Yeah, uh, just in response to uh, Mr. Reardon, um, this, uh, this project, since I've been on Council, has been moving along. And I thought that uh, to have actually talking with Witt, because it is a very important street for Clearwater, but it, it's not a simple one. It, it encompasses Clearwater County and state. I mean, it, it has many different uh, uh, areas that need to be affected differently. And so I was really uh, supportive of having the DOT do the engineering on it and move moving along. So I'm glad that it, that has started. And what we want to do is make sure this is done right. And I think we're going in that direction. So I want to make sure that's in the record as well. Yep. Hey, thank you, Council Member. Uh, Mayor Borjowski. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Am I yes. On? Okay. Um, I also wanted to um, say something similar as, as Council Member All, All Britain. This kind of got moved up to the head of the class, if you will, ahead of other projects. But I will. I did want to say that it, it really took two years of discussions for Edgewater Drive's uh, speed reduction. One year of very active with FDOT, and I think Whit can, um, you know concur on that one. Uh, nothing, no, if I love FDOT, nothing against them, but nothing we do with them is fast. It just never is. It's a, it's a process we have to go through. So, um, so Mike, I think we're, I think we're, everybody's working as hard as they can. I, I do. Yep. I think they did a great job pulling the dollars together for this in this fiscal year. Yeah, I think between, the, yeah, I agree with you. I think that between the studies, between the fact that I know several of us have gone out there and walked it to actually feel and see what it's like and understanding where we are in the preliminary engineering study phase right now, I think, you know, again, it, take, it does take time. And I know that there's a lot of safety concerns. That's a, I know that's Mike's, you know, major concern here and the slowing the traffic down for crying out loud. I don't, I don't, I, I, I'm imagining, what, do we know who, patrols that I mean who maybe does or doesn't patrol that is that police sheriff and highway patrol or is it all the who, who whose primary responsibility is it because I do know from like Betty Lane to the to the east or excuse me to the west as it goes downhill past that golf I mean people literally fly and there are missing sidewalks um, there are people that would have to go walking out into the street which you know, I guess the lanes are about you know, three feet wide. No, they're probably like 10 feet wide, but um, they feel that like, like you could raise your elbow up on that sidewalk and get hit um, if you weren't careful. It is really dangerous. And the only thing we can do right now is slow the traffic down. I, I don't know that I've ever seen, I mean, I don't drive it every day, but I drive it often. I don't know if I've ever seen anybody out there um, trying to get people to slow down. 
Um, again, I think it's Sadiq Clearwater primarily, but that's a good question. Yeah, um, certainly, certainly would like to see a, a commitment to that uh, from our, from our well, whoever it is, police, sheriff. Uh, I'm sure it's one of the two, uh, because that that really is a problem. I mean, the speeds there are just ridiculous. And I, I we, do we know what the speed limits are through there? I mean, is it? It's 40 they, right here. It's 35 a little further to the west. It's 30 in downtown. It's 45 the further east you go. Um, so from so from um, I don't know. Let's call it uh, County Road One to the west. Is that that's about 40? That's 40, 40 generally oh. until you get to downtown, and then it's 30 to 35. So Betty Lane and down that hill is about 35. No, it's 40 there. 40. Yeah. And, and like like the Kimley Horn study showed, people are averaging over 50. Yeah. Uh, I, that's my commute home every day. And I drive the speed limit just on purpose and just to kind of see how many people fly past me. <laughs> yeah. Or they come up right on your tail and honk. <laughs> and, and then the and weaving, then the weaving is what does it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that I think that the 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 the, the, strong, the long process that we go through is going, it's it's moving. We're not sitting on it. Yeah. But I think in the in the interim, we've got to be able to do something with that speed. And I, you know, again, I don't. We need to get that uh, that request, I guess, officially made to whoever. Uh, maybe maybe Councilmember Albritton can talk to his police, and we can talk to our sheriff, and whoever patrols that area can up the ante a little bit, um, at least from a visual standpoint. I, you know. Just my experience is that um, you can do enforcement and enforcement does help. It can change behavior, uh, but it's got to be sustained for a long, long yeah. time. And the best remedy is design. And if you really want to change behavior, you change design. Hey, Whit, do you know what those speed feedback signs cost to put and in? I don't off the top of my head. I don't. I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I'd we like can, to we can mean, find that, that out. Yeah, I'd like to find that out because there's something I tell you, there are a lot of law abiding people that do look at those speed feedback signs and they slow down, especially the one that says, you know, you're going 65 and a 35 or a 40. Um, so they do help uh, to bring the speeds down. Um, that might be another short term solution that and a little more presence, but uh, all right. Uh, okay. Let's, Oh, I see mayor Bujowski, a quick comment and then we're going to move on. Yeah. I was just going to say they're, they're about 10 grand, those speed feedback signs. I, I only know this because we we live and die by those in Dunedin. Yeah, they're really good. I think they, they are. really make it. And, like and they really like, work. They really work. For 90% of the people. And it, again, yeah. that'll slow a lot of people down. All right, Whit, let's move on to safe streets. Excuse me, Commissioner Eggers. I think we had said we were going to take other public comment on this in case any other members of the public wish to speak. I thought we had taken public comment. No, oh, on Drew Street. On Drew Street. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're right. I apologize. Drew Street. Yeah, go ahead. Any members of the public who wish to speak on this item, please use the raise hand button or hit star nine if you're on the phone. And we have no one else wishing to speak on this item. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Appreciate that. Okay, quickly, right. uh, these will these will go fast. Uh, Safe Streets yeah. Pinellas update. I just want to uh, commend our staff, Sarah in particular, for um, getting this going, Amy Elmore helping. Uh, we went from an uh, in-person summit that we planned in March to an online eight-week campaign to raise awareness. We've had more than 200 comments on our interactive map, and you can see some of the comments on the map to the right. Um, this is the final week uh, to allow the public to comment on safety issues and concerns anywhere in Pinellas County whether it's Drew Street or US-19 or any other road. Um, and we've had more than 10,000 people through social media, 3,000 video views. I know a number of our board members and um, committee members have done uh, little videos on what safety and Safe Streets Pinellas means to them. Um, we are gonna be having um, an art contest coming soon. Uh, we've done some quizzes to allow people to test their street smarts. And if you participate, your um, eligible to participate in a prize drawing. Um, and we are asking people to share their videos and posts on social media pages. Uh, and all the board members, we encourage you to participate and look for emails from us for next steps in Safe Streets Pinellas. Okay. Any questions for me? I'll just keep going. Any questions for Witt on that? 
Okay, go ahead, Whit. All right. Uh, next, uh, kind of along this line, we did a public participation uh, plan evaluation. We have uh, that requirement um, to have a public participation plan. And uh, every time we adopt a long range plan, which we did last November, we go in and do an evaluation of how did we do, what do we need to change in our public participation plan? Al Bartolotta led this effort. And uh, the conclusion is, is um, that we, um, by all measures of the evaluation, we are doing much better in terms of public outreach and engagement. Uh, you can see some of the statistics here, 150 meetings, workshops, and public events over about a three-year period, um, 68,000 unique page views of our website in 2019 alone. That was a 12% increase. Uh, our Facebook post reached 50,000 people in 2019. Uh, three times higher than 2018. And then we had really great participation in our statistically valid survey uh, and um, a couple of other surveys that we did uh, throughout Pinellas County in 2018 and 2019 that helped us with the plan. So we're not recommending any changes to the public participation plan at this time. Um, but, you know, like you said earlier, Mr. Chairman, we can always do better. Uh, there's always opportunities to engage the public differently and, and get meaningful input. Uh, so that leads me to the next item, which is uh, an equity assessment that we want to undertake hey, hey, for the agency. Hey, Whit, Whit yeah. just one second. Sarah, I, I don't know if we were, were we getting anybody that wanted to comment on uh, 6C or 6D real quickly? Anybody from the public? Any members of the public who wish to speak on the Safe Streets Pinellas online campaign or public participation plan evaluation, please hit the raise hand button or press star nine on the phone. There is no one wishing to speak on this. Okay, items. thank you. Uh, sorry about that, Whit. Let's go on with, I thought I wanted okay. to separate this one out separately. This was important, so. Yeah, so, um, you know, there's there's been a lot going on. Uh, <laughs> Uh, with, um, you know, um, the issues with, related to the pandemic uh, and also with, um, you know, the protests. And I just feel like, you know, we have a, a mission. We've adopted the American Institute of Certified Planners Code of Ethics. And um, one of our responsibilities in that code of ethics is to seek social justice uh, by working to expand choice and opportunity. Uh, and to uh, look at the policies, institutions, and decisions that oppose uh, such need. Um, so I'm sort of compelled uh, from that standpoint. Also, um, I'm a member of Unite Pinellas and I took a, a pledge for equity uh, in, in all things when we joined that organization. So what I wanted to do was just lay out for you um, a, a potential equity assessment, unless you all tell me not to do it, uh, that we think is important to look at our organization, our structure, our committee memberships, our public outreach methods, um, the, the projects and uh, work products that we produce, uh, and importantly, the outcomes of our planning activities. So we're at the very beginning stages of that. Um, we, are, we made the decision not to hire a consultant to do this, but to do the work in-house. We may use a consultant to provide some advice or guidance, uh, but we think it's best if we do it internally and um, what I want to use is an outside um, uh, uh, voice to help us and guide us. So um, I've asked Unite Pinellas, they have a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee to be a voice of feedback and guidance to us, also the board uh, and stakeholders. So we're in this beginning of phase one where we are beginning to scope what an equity assessment might look like. Um, we will be conducting interviews over the summer with key stakeholders. Uh, in our minority and disadvantaged uh, communities. Uh, we'll define the objectives of this program, look at some best practices. Uh, we also have been um, given an equity tool that we can use. Um, so there's some online resources that are pretty good. Um, and then we'll put together a schedule. Um, we will bring back that scope of services to this board in September. Um, that's our goal, to have you look at the scope and give me feedback on that. Uh, and then what I anticipate is over the fall and winter is we would um, conduct that work plan to really look at an evaluation of our agency, um, look at opportunities and weaknesses, ways of improvement, what some alternatives are, and 
really understanding how that might change our cells operationally and what the physical impact of that might be, um, and then develop some recommendations going forward. And then I see phase three being a longer period of time, uh, but really starting on that with what we can do in the near term. And I'll give you an example. We have um, a bicycle pedestrian advisory board or committee um, that is, uh, if I remember right, is all white. Uh, we don't have any term limits. Um, we, we struggle sometimes to get South County residents on our boards because we meet up here in Clearwater and transportation access is an issue. So um, I could see some changes to some of those items um, and then breaking them out into some longer term uh, actions. And then I think it's also important to have an evaluation of the effectiveness of any changes we make and what kind of um, out, outcomes that's, that's having. Um, so I see the work product ultimately being um, a, an action plan, a reporting process, and a monitoring program uh, for equity in all things that we do. Um, so again, we're just at the very beginning, and I welcome any feedback or guidance that you can give us today. Uh, well, first of all, Whit, I just I, I, when you brought this, uh, you mentioned this to me a, a week or so ago. I was just really proud of your team uh, to, for taking a kind of a proactive approach to this. I think it's it's really important that we try to build this um, with good conversation internally. You gotta look in the mirror, see if we're doing things okay, and then have that external check as well. Um, and then as we go forward, um, over time, making some changes that uh, better reflect uh, uh, our community uh, in general. I don't think that's a, I think that's only a good thing. So um, I'm just uh, really, really proud of that, the, the initial look and look forward to uh, some of the work coming back our way. So. Thank you. Um, Sarah, who do we have that would like to speak? I can't see. We have um, uh, Commissioner Welch first, followed by Mayor Bujalski. Okay, uh, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'll just echo your comments. I just wanna commend with um, having this inclusive lens is so important. It's gonna improve for Pinellas, but it's also gonna improve our planning products for our community going forward. So I just wanna commend them as well. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Mayor Bujalski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I too concur with your comments. Um, and, and quick question, will we also be looking internally into our organization for, for equity? Uh, yeah, that's, that's our intent. Uh, the Pinellas County Human Resources Department does keep track of the diversity of our staff. Uh, so they, they provide us that information. Um, but internally to me also means um, you know, the organizational structure, the committee composition, um, you know, we're, we're larger than just the 17 staff we have. Sure. Well, thank you. And I look forward to, uh, you know, the different ideas and things that you want to bring forward. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments from the board? Sarah, would you, oh, is that Mayor Kennedy, did you? Yeah, I just wanted to, I think this is wonderful. And I love the piece about the United Pinellas. I think that's great. And with, it's just wonderful. I appreciate you for doing this. That's all. Thank just you, Just so Mayor. you all know, um, Angela Ryan of our staff will take the lead and she'll be supported by Rodney Chapman and myself on this. Excellent. Okay, look forward, look forward to that. Sarah, do we have anybody from the public that would like to comment? Any members of the public who wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button in Zoom or star nine on the phone. I see no members of the public wishing to speak on this item. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, and then we're just gonna fly through the informational items. You can see pretty much your, uh, for yourself there. Um, just as, as a note, always taking a look at the fatalities map, just to kind of puts it in perspective what we're supposed to be doing here. In 2018, we had 120 fatalities. In 2019, 106. And 2020, year to date, 46. Uh, probably a little bit. We haven't been out on the roads as much. But um, so just in perspective. On committee, committee vacancies, we have three LCB vacancies, a TD writer, a public educate from public education, and from children at risk. Um, and uh, just as a um, additional comments, uh, upcoming events, excuse me, announcements, uh, the TMA, MPO Chairs Coordinating Committee and the Summit with Central Florida MPO Alliance uh, featuring um, 
the secretary panel discussion with Secretary Gwen and the secretaries of District 1 and 5 will hold the virtual meetings on Friday, July 10th in Zoom. They're going to be sub one meeting after another. So TMA will be a one hour meeting and then we'll MPO coordinating uh, committee meeting will be, I think, an hour. Um, uh, Council Member Rice chairs that group as well. So um, that's coming up this Friday, 10 o'clock. Whit, does it start at 9 or 9.30 with TMA? We start at 9. It's a, it's a bit of a change. But that's because we're trying to fit a bunch of meetings in that morning. Okay. And um, and then uh, just two last things. First, does a, any other board member have anything they want to bring up uh, for the good of the, the good of the order? And then the final comment would just be, uh, thank you and staff, uh, Tina, Sarah, others who have been involved in pulling this together. I think they do a great job. We even have a prep meeting for this to make sure we're <laughs> got the, all the kinks worked out. So um, anyway, thank, thank you all for making this seamless and perf uh, really well done meeting. Um, and with that, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.